have experienced um, having a firm understanding or reminder about your key roles as McKinney-Vento liaisons, uh, roles and responsibilities. Also, um, we'll have discussion about what effective service delivery looks like in this in these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. And also, you will have an opportunity to experience and, nur and nurture uh, collaborative relationships with each other and also with um, agencies and resources uh, that you will um, hear about today. So with that, uh, we are honored and grateful to be able to um, have a time of acknowledging the land that we occupy today. And slide please. Like to welcome John Claymore. Um, he is the director at OSPI of the Office of Native Education. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is John Claymore, the director of Native Education for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, like Sharon mentioned a little earlier, she's new new to the system. I'm fairly new myself. I um, reported to the office on February 10th, um, 30 days in, told to go home and work remotely. So didn't get the opportunity to um, network with everybody um, as needed and so forth, but um, look forward to this opportunity to be able to share um, some of the work that's taking place within the Office of Native Education. Um, and one of those pieces is um, around land acknowledgements with the momentum that's taking place around land acknowledgements right now. Um, as you heard, um, or, or what, I, what I'll be providing you is my own land acknowledgement. And what I wanna make sure that everybody is aware of on the call that um, there's no right or wrong way to provide a land acknowledgement as long as, we're, as, long as we are um, acknowledging the right lands. And that could be tricky at times um, because we're talking um, both about federally and non-federally recognized tribes. And um, our slide deck here will, um, I'm not gonna um, get into detail about that, knowing that there's work, um, there's work in progress as we speak. And I'll show you some of those, um, some of the different um, uh, next steps as far as internal and external um, trainings that will be taking place. But I, I wanna provide you with my land acknowledgement. And, um, and again, knowing that um, all these sound, might sound a little bit different and so forth. But again, my name is John Claymore. I'm the Director of Native Education for the Office of Superint Superintendent of Public Instruction. I come to you from the traditional lands of the Suquamish people. I live up here in Paulsville, Washington. I was born out in Crow Agency, Montana. I grew up in Fort Yates, North Dakota on a Standing Rock Reservation. And I'm enrolled down in Eagle Butte, South Dakota on my father's side. Uh, in, um, down in Eagle Butte, South Dakota on a Cheyenne River Reservation. There are seven different bands of the Lakota Sioux. I belong to what's called the Hunkpapa Sioux. On my mother's side, she's enrolled Chippewa from the White Earth Reservation out in White Earth, Minnesota. I come to you today with an open heart and as a continual learner and just to really appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to share today. But uh, so as you as you witness there, our land acknowledgement is basically a story of who we are and where we came from and and as we move forward. And uh, in my land acknowledgement, you've seen in there that I, rec or I recognized um, growing up in Fort Yates, North Dakota on a Standing Rock Reservation. And this is one of my all time favorite quotes. Um, probably every, everybody's seen it. It's one of the most popular quotes out there, but it comes from Chief, um, Chief Sitting Ball from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And, it's a, and it goes, let us put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children. As gr growing up on Standing Rock, um, Chief Sitting Bull's um, gravesite was there and with a big um, boulder put on top of it for a reason. Way back in the day, Chief Sitting Bull was dug up from his gravesite and moved down to Mobridge, South Dakota. And, um, and that, that's some of the history that we don't always hear about or, or learn or, or, or aware of. Um, and what happened was um, the folks from Standing Rock went back down and, and, and got him back and brought him back up to Fort Yates where he belonged and so forth, put a big boulder on top of that so that th that would never happen again. There was different times that um, as I was growing up as a young man, I'd, be, I'd find myself sitting on top of that boulder for hours at a time. My dad would come and get me from that boulder and you know, bring me home at times. 
but that's just that just kind of goes and shows the the connection to the land and how important that is for us native folks next slide please this here is 20 seconds of power folks um and this is from the kalispell tribe and uh pictures music and a lot of um action within so can you show the slide please As you see the slide heading up top since time immemorial and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well but um it really tells the story in 20 seconds on on where we are or where we were where we're at and where we're going when we start talking about land acknowledgements and again um i just want to make sure that um, everybody knows that there's a lot of work um in place right now that's that's taking place in regards to um, coming up with the land acknowledgement that would be consistent to help and support and again the intent there is to not put not put people in in um, a bad position by recognizing um, lands that um, wouldn't be accurate or correct but basically you know what is a land acknowledgement and I, I want to read these next two slides and I always had a hard time when people read slides to me during a presentation and so forth but I think it's really appropriate that we um, go word for word on this says a, a land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. And again, it's all about that connection, the connection to land. It's not just about the soil on the ground. It's about what comes out of it. It's what, what goes within our, what um, swims within our rivers. It's what grows up on top of our mountains. Um, there's a real deep connection between land and Native Americans. Next slide, please. And I say, why do we recognize the land? And again, this, I, I want to read this one as well. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory you, re, you, you reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land since time immemorial. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to and to seek to understand your place within that history. And what what this is all about, or what the momentum that's also um, coming out of the land acknowledgement is also the need for tribal consultation to take place. And there's reasons why we need to um, consult with our tribes and so forth. And um, I won't be sharing it today, but um, there's all kinds of data within our own OSPI annual report card that um, definitely would be considered red flags or red flags and, and so forth on, on um, the data around Native American education, Native American learners. Um, one thing I do want to mention from that slide and hopefully will um, bring some attention and it is bringing attention not, not only throughout the state, but throughout the nation. And that's the dropout rate, also commonly referred to as the pushout rate. Um, and what that means to, as a Native American learner, we have a 24% dropout rate in place. That's double that of any other um, ethnicity identified with the next closest coming in at 11.2%. When we talk about a 24% dropout rate, folks, we're talking about over 15,000 kids dropping out on an annual basis out of a total of 61,000. The way we're collecting data is also an issue and there's also work um, being or taking place in, in that area as well. So this year, the, the, the next slide here that, that popped up is some of the work as far as tribal consultation that's taking place. And this, is, um, this um, consultation should be emulated by others. And it's taking place between the Nisqually Tribe and North Thurston School District. Um, some of the different things that are, that are happening there within the North Thurston School District, raising the flag, the Nisqually flag at all 22 or 23 different schools within North Thurston School District. We have um, um, Nisqually Tribal Council members, uh, Willie Frank III and, and um, Hanford McLeod going in and not only teaching to kids, but teaching to, to adults as well, as far as bringing an understanding and awareness to what's taking place. But the work there that's, take, that, that's happening is um, incredible. And I can just imagine when a kid, when, when a native student um, joins that camp or walks onto that campus and sees that flag on top of the, or on that flagpole, that's a sense of belonging. That's a sense of ownership. 
So, um, and we'll be talking some more, not today, about the tribal consultation process as well and, and um, gaining a lot of momentum in that area as well. Next slide, please. All right, these are some next steps on internal and external plans with the land acknowledgement. On, on 1020, we put together a meeting with the uh, tribal leaders throughout the state. We I think we had um, 12 to 15 tribal leaders um, represented on that, um, on that training, and they um, provided that training to the assistant superintendents. Um, well taken, and um, next steps would be um, to make sure that we're, we're reaching out and providing that training to others as well. Um, we, on 11-6, we, we trained the Northwest Education um, Service District. Um, on 11-10, we're, where we're at today, is the McKinney-Vento training. Um, on 11-12, I invite all of you um, to, if you haven't got the invite, to uh, um, take a look at those GATE webinars. The, the, the Office of Native Education, um, Dr. Laura Lynn and myself will be presenting in the morning. That's an AM session. And we'll be laying the foundation on what um, what it looks like as far as native um, native learners and data and so forth. And then in the afternoon we have Muckleshoot Tribal School, John Lombardi and uh, and um, Joseph Martin, and the Muckleshoot Tribal School team on um, presenting um, during the first part and the second are in the afternoon session. Then we have um, Nisqually and North Thurston coming on presenting the second half of that um, section in the afternoon. So that's that's going to be exciting. And then. Um, what we have in place right now is we're reaching out to the tribal leaders, the, the tribal chairs from both um, Squaxin and Nisqually to do some leader to leader consultation with Superintendent Reichdahl. Um, and again, the intent there is to come up with a template um, that we could use um, statewide, identifying the different reservations, um, identifying contact people within those reservations and, uh, um, and so forth. So, and and with, the, with the intent of coming out with a, a template, a consistent template. Um, also, that we'll be um, presenting the Office of Native Education will be sent, present internally to all OSPI staff in our stride training that will be coming up either um, at towards the end of this month or early December. And then um, what else? Oh, the other area that we're going to really focus on is those 39 um, ESSA districts that are required to um, take part in consultation. Um, so if if those school if one of those schools that we'll, we'll be we'll be reaching out and taking a look at um, what that looks like as far as next steps next slide please this here is a is a picture um and it comes from the the land of the quinault out in tola washington um the the young people in the in the canoe is from kingston high school um, my son goes to Kingston High School. This is a, a football team um, trip that was planned, a three-day trip out to our spending time on the beach, camping out on a beach and doing some teamwork um, or building on the teamwork concepts and so forth. But anyway, um, with this, I, I use this picture as an analogy and it, and it really makes sense um, to me and others as well. And uh, what, what you see there is it's an ocean going canoe. This is one of the first canoes that um, was put into the, the ocean from the land of the Quinault that, that took part on, in these um, canoe journeys during the summer. This um, canoe is called Wolf's Coat. That's the name, that's the Quinault word on the side of the canoe. Um, can carry up to 20 plus um, people within um, the canoe itself. This canoe has over 12,000 miles on it in the ocean. It's been on the ocean for over 30 days in one, in one journey. And when we take a look at this, and the analogy that I use is all paddles um, pulling together as one. As you can see in the picture, we're not all in unison. Um, way in the back there, the young man has his paddle totally out of the water while the front are pulling hard and so forth. And, but I'll tell you, this was up the river uh, as we were making our way up the Quinault River. On our way down, we were cracking, boy, I'll tell you what, that thing was this, um, scooting right along the, the, the water as we made our way towards the, the mouth of the, the ocean. And I had to remind the kids that I did not get per permission slips from parents to get them into the ocean. The, the river was okay. But what a valuable learning opportunity for all involved. I want, want to um, um, also make note that uh, with the, the building of this canoe, there was no measuring tape or any type of measuring device allowed. So our, our, our that took part in this, this was um, done through traditional ways. And I'll tell you this canoe, like I said, it glided across that water as it, as it dug deep and pulled hard. 
and the lessons from the skipper in the back. That's my brother, one of my um, native brothers, um, Richie, Richie Underwood, who took us up and down and provided lessons on transportation highways all the way to getting to the other side of the mountains in a, in a canoe like this and so forth. So, and, and what that meant to folks. But um, I, I with that said, I really want to thank you for allowing me to share um, information, knowing that there's more to come um, with this training as well. So um, one, with, with everything that's taking place around us and so forth, then it's just critical that we, what I do, what I say is we weave these resources to make sense for these kids and support in whatever way we can. We reach with long arms, taking care and making sure that we wrap around these kids with the support as needed. I want to thank you for your time and your understanding. If there's any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm taking part in this presentation and we'll answer accordingly. Hands up. When, when you see natives do this, it's hands up. Power to you. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John, um, for sharing with us and gracing us, setting the stage for our training this morning. And as you said, we'll look forward to um, many opportunities to come together again and, and learn more for further learning. And so thank you so much again. Okay. So again, want to welcome everyone. We're so excited that you are joining us today for our autumn McKinney Vento training. And um, so we're just, we have a lot of information. It's a, a, a packed day for you. Lots of activity, lots of learning, lots of time for you all to connect with one another. Uh, before we move forward into the content, um, just want to offer a few technical uh, considerations. First and foremost, just want to let you know that there is an option um, to utilize uh, closed captioning if that is something that you would like to do. When you look at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a closed caption option. If you select that, then you can customize it to meet your needs. And with that, I'd like to introduce Tony, who is going to offer a couple of other technical considerations. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Sharon. Um, just, yeah, I want to go over a few things today. Um, uh, first off is uh, if you run into any technical problems throughout the course of today's session, uh, please, you know, pop that into the chat box as, as quickly as you can and, and report what's going on. Um, I'm going to be behind the scenes here today and helping out take care of anything that may arise like that. Uh, it looks like we're good to go. Everything's looking and sounding good. Um, that's a good sign. Um, also, just want to uh, let you know, since this is a long session, you may want to change the view on your eyes. Um, so as you're looking at your Zoom window, in the upper right, there is a little icon that says view. I just want to bring your attention to that to let you know that you as the participant can choose how you view your screen. Um, again, so it's a long day. You may want to uh, swap out your views sometimes, maybe just look at all the content or maybe look at the camera or just a nice split screen. But I wanted to let everyone know that um, you have the opportunity to change that. That's always a good thing for um, longer sessions such as today. Um, also, uh, when we get to, uh, later today, uh, we'll talk more about this later, we will be utilizing breakout sessions. Um, so um, it's somewhat new for us on this large of a scale. So we do ask just, you know, be, be patient. We're gonna work to get everybody uh, where they need to go at that time. But again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, also, again, um, if anything else arises uh, in that chat, just let us know. Um, I do see someone mentioning the closed caption button. Um, yes, I've noticed I do not see that either. So I'll work on that in the background and uh, we'll just go ahead and move on. And again, please use that chat to let, let us know of anything that may not be working for you. We certainly want to make this a great experience and have everything work properly. So again, let us know if something's not uh, coming up to your expectations technology-wise and we'll take care of it. I'll work on that ca closed captioning thing right now in the background. And with that, I'll let you get back on to your session. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, incredibly helpful and we appreciate you. So um, just a few other, um, just a snapshot of what we are gonna move through this morning, just in our introductory session of this training. Um, the next thing is we really wanna know who you are. So thank you for putting information in the chat box and for giving your shout outs. Uh, uh, that I know that you're really excited to see one another and it's been a really long time. So again, we are excited that you are here. 
Um, we are gonna ask you in a moment, we're gonna advance the slide and you'll be able to see how you can change your name um, and alter it in, uh, as, a, as your participant name so that we can see not only your name, but uh, the organization that you represent and where you're from. So um, we're gonna introduce ourselves briefly and then we are honored to uh, be able to receive opening comments from our assistant superintendent, Martin Mueller. Uh, we will review the OSPI mission, vision, and values. We'll take a quick look at the agenda for the day, and then we'll move right into the nuts and bolts of this training session. So slide, please. All right, so welcome again. Um, these, you'll see on your screen information about how to adjust your name and so forth in the, um, so if you, let's see, make sure I see it. If you uh, access participants, as it's shown there on the screen, which is in your toolbar, uh, you find your name and you'll wanna hover over it. And then you'll see the option to click rename. Um, so again, if you add uh, your, your, the organization that you are representing today, and maybe your location, that would be wonderful. And you'll see my example there uh, for me as your OSPI trainer today, etc. And then you select OK, and then it will save it that way. It's really important uh, that you uh, make this adjustment. It will be very helpful um, as we will be taking attendance in a few minutes and you will want to receive your clock hours. And also it's helpful for us to know who is with us today. Slide please. As you're doing that, we're also going to go ahead and put up a, a little poll for you. Uh, a couple of questions, just two quick questions that will help us again to know who you are so that as we are presenting this training, um, it'll be helpful to, and there you go. You guys already get it, so I won't elaborate. I see the numbers tabulating. And then again, it will be helpful for us as we're presenting to you today uh, that we are speaking to the audience that um, you represent. So the numbers are tabulating and we are almost uh, finished with the polling. And I am wondering, Aubrey, um, and Aubrey Schlotman, I should say, is uh, the person behind, behind the slides this morning. And I, we could not be here without her this morning. So I'm just giving a shout out uh, now to Aubrey. Thank you so much, Aubrey, for being there and for everything that you are doing to make this training a success today. All right, so I am wondering if we can advance to the next slide while the poll is help tabulating. All right, so um, you'll see that <laughs> this is the homeless education team uh, at OSPI, including myself there in the middle. It's the truest version <laughs> of us. So we just wanna again say welcome, welcome, welcome and we are so glad that you are here. Okay. So with that, uh, we do have our assistant superintendent, Martin Mueller, who is prepared with opening comments. And I am wondering, Aubrey, um, if we can go ahead and move to uh, Assistant Superintendent Mueller's slide while the poll results are tabulating. Okay, and good morning, Assistant Superintendent Mueller. Thank you, Sharon. I really uh, appreciate it. Love those pictures, by the way. Um, and thanks, I wanna extend my thanks to our, our team that's coordinating this work today. Sharon already um, uh, thanked Aubrey, uh, but to you, Sharon, Keith, Matt, and Melinda, thanks so much for um, your hard work pulling this training together today. And thank, thank you to all of you looking at uh, 253 participants today for your time, uh, uh, your focus, focusing on this important um, a group of students that we serve, your compassion, your flexibility, and, and certainly we hope your grace as we work our way through uh, the training today. Um, 
uh, as you all have experienced, I'm sure in your lives, uh, uh, doing these, these digital trainings have their own wrinkles and, and we want to make it enriching and real for you with breakout sessions. And so um, uh, please have grace with us as we work our way through that. You know, we're living in the health crisis and it's impacted all of our lives, but none more than those um, uh, who are uh, living with economic insecurity. You know, a central aspect of homelessness is poverty, and uh, the pandemic has accelerated economic disparity across society, but most importantly among Washingtonians. This makes the work that we're doing in this training today all that more important, uh, improving educational outcomes, uh, ensuring high quality uh, educational experiences for our children and youth experiencing homelessness, or it's, it's just more important than ever. Uh, um, the McKinney-Vento Act has been a stalwart uh, uh, framework for many, many years to ensure that um, kids have quality, stable education and in Washington, we've made a number of advances, particularly in the last five years that complement and actually accelerate uh, uh, or extend the McKinney-Vento Act. And, and you'll learn about all that today. That's part of the training today, learning about the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of the McKinney-Vento Act and certainly about uh, some of the Washington initiatives that we have. We have the Homeless Student uh, um, Stability Program uh, where we work in partnership with the Department of Commerce uh, to provide resources to you all for housing and educational stability. It really is a complementary program to um, McKinney-Vento with partial credit law and, and our implementation of that uh, so that uh, we can foster portability of that really important currency uh, uh, credit uh, so that our, our children and youth experiencing homelessness have that opportunity to bring that with them as as uh, uh, the challenges to, uh, to, to, to stability uh, occur in their life. We had a, a performance audit in the last two years that, that was designed to help us think about how can we improve building on uh, the educational outcomes for children and, and, and youth experiencing homelessness. And, and we got great feedback. It was, it was rough, you know, uh, uh, sometimes feedback is tough, but we got great feedback and, and uh, uh, working hard on, on improvement. Um, and certainly this year, the codification of project education impact. So that's a law that passed this year that, that uh, adopted into a law, an initiative that we've been working on for about the past three years, working with our non-governmental partners, our agency partners uh, to improve educational outcomes for children and youth experiencing homelessness or living in foster care. And uh, we have an ambitious goal of that group that, that, uh, that these youth will, will have education parity with their peers by 2028. And we're working hard on that. And, and you'll see policy recommendations moving forward from that group here in the coming weeks uh, for the next legislative session. So, so lots of work going on in Washington. I also have to say, you know, our, our past, both our our recent past and our historical past calls on us to ground this work in racial justice. And so this will be a central theme that you'll uh, be learning about today. I think it's probably the next part of our agenda. Can't do adequately uh, the work that we need to do, uh, improving educational outcomes for, for children and youth experiencing home, homelessness without grounding our work in racial justice. Um, obviously, the coronavirus has forced us to be flexible, to be adaptable, to be creative, um, to find new ways of doing things. And I know that you all are wrestling with that challenge just like we are today. And I really um, I urge you to bring that creative creativity, that openness to finding new ways uh, focused on the mission that we have uh, for, uh, for um, this group of kids that we care so much about today. And, and, um, and, and have that be a springboard for, for change and, and for improvement. So I will pass it back to Sharon uh, and I hope you all have a fabulous day. Thank you. Thank you so much as, um, as super, Assistant Superintendent Mueller. We appreciate your words, your encouragement and your leadership. Thank you so much. So, um, Given that, um, all that uh, Martin Mueller shared with us this morning, we're going to take a quick review of our agency's vision, mission, and values, which do support uh, the same ideas. Uh, so our vision is that all students prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civil and civic engagement. 
Our mission is to transform K through 12 education to a system that is centered on closing opportunity gaps and is characterized by high expectation for all students and educators. We achieve this by developing equity-based policies and supports that do empower educators, families, and communities. And our values uh, that we cling to are that we will ensure equity uh, through collaboration and service and uh, through ach achieving excellence through continuous improvement in all areas and absolutely by focusing on, on the whole child. And slide please. So this next section, um, you know, it is powerful and um, I should say is also powerful. And I'm gonna just pause for a minute on this slide to give you an opportunity to absorb the message contained uh, in the wording there. It is a privilege to educate yourself about racism instead of experiencing it. So we are going to, um, move into a time of discussion regarding racism, uh, systemic racism and how it impacts uh, the students and families that we serve. Uh, as superint Assistant Superintendent uh, Martin Mueller referenced, uh, it is our co collective responsibility to ensure that those who are uh, at greatest risk for marginalization, who are the most vulnerable of our community. Uh, it is our collective responsibility to ensure uh, holistic support um, of those students as well as all students within our community and addressing racism is a very important part uh, of that work. Uh, and this is one of uh, many conversations and opportunities that we look forward to having with you in regards to race and racism um, within our schools. So with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Matt Smith to join the discussion. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm grateful to be with you all this morning. Grateful for the work uh, that you're doing already and the work that uh, we're doing together. So if you've been to our trainings before, this, this may feel a little different and a little new. Um, as uh, Martin Mueller referenced, this is our work. This is our public commitment to centering racial justice. And I've been at OSPF for a little over a year. And one of the reasons I applied to join this team is because racial justice is included and the law that authorizes the, the program that I'm privileged to manage. That's the Homeless Student Stability Program. So today is certainly just an introduction. This may be new work for some of us and a reminder for those who have lived experience of racism or years of professional experience um, working for racial justice. So thank you for that work and for your attention today. Next slide, please. So you heard from our dear colleague, John Claymore earlier, who often talks about our culture of candor. And we hope that our intentions and our kindness is enough. And we have to recognize that it isn't enough to have good intentions. Um, this is ongoing lifelong work that happens at the individual level, at the school, at the district, the, at the agency levels across the state. And this isn't about guilt or shame, but knowing better and then taking that knowledge to do better. So our expectation is that we'll have both your partnership and your accountability um, when we need to do better in this work. Um, this moment in history is an opportunity and that isn't just because it's become safer to say Black Lives Matter and water is life and no kids in cages, but also because enough people are truly listening and paying attention to racial injustice that meaningful change can and will happen if we all commit to it honestly and with humility. And that's the spirit I join you with today. Next slide, please. 
so you saw a little bit about our values and one of those is ensuring equity. And it's important to have strong values and equity statements put into words. It's even more important to put those words into action. So this is the OSPI equity statement. And you'll see there are some highlights here that we are committing to examine the ways current policies and practices result in disparate outcomes. And then there's a whole list of student identities listed beyond that. Now we all know that students of homelessness experience disparate outcomes compared to their housed peers. But we also have to acknowledge that intersectionality, which means their disproportionate outcomes are compounded by race, by gender identity and sexual orientation, those who are English learners, those receiving special education supports. And it's our responsibility, not only to understand the historical context that led to those conditions, but to actively dismantle systemic barriers and replace them with policy and practice that supports those students. And now we'll have an opportunity, um, our first opportunity today to hear from those people we're all here to support. And those are our students who have experienced homelessness. So next slide, please. I just graduated from White Swan High School. I just graduated from North Central High School, planning to attend Eastern Washington University. I'm currently attending Lower Columbia Community College. I am a sophomore at Central Washington University in Ellensburg, Washington. It's kind of hard too because I'm in a school where it is majority white and there's not really more African American people there. And so I already feel singled out when, once I walk through those doors. There weren't many, very many Hispanics um, in my town. Being a native on the reservation, like you kind of go unnoticed. I get called the N-word every year since I've been at North Central High School for the past four years of my life. Um, it didn't really help to have people bully me because I was brown, because I had hair on my arms, because things that didn't even make sense. And plus our school mascot is native is a Native American person. <laughs> it's Native American, so that's also disrespectful because I am an Native American myself too, so it's also disrespectful when people are trying to copy your culture, which is not supposed to be copied. People kind of always like give up on us natives. Um, they checked up on me like once a week. I had at least I heard him, but I couldn't find anything. An admin or a staff member check up on me once a week to know, like, how's my living space doing? How am I doing mentally? How am I doing physically? So having to check up on the student or check up on me was really helpful and really made me feel like they cared about me. And I would just kind of be there, but nobody noticed me. And I feel like when this one teacher noticed me, it was like, what? <laughs> and I just feel like, you know, teachers and schools just need to like, I don't know, take time to invest in every single student, like whether they do have a stable home or not. Like, I feel like just saying like, hi, like, and like say their name it makes them feel special she allowed me to do my own thing place me with students so i can help and teach them it meant so much and it's a big memory that i have of high school and it's with her i think it was silly but it made me feel whole included 
and looked up to. Because she had the same skin color as me, so she she kind of knew the struggles of being an African American person in America. So like, I kind of already connect with her. Let them know that, you know, it's a safe place and it's a safe community, and like. When they're ready to share whatever's going on, you're ready to listen. Not everyone is in the same like playing field and just kind of try to be a little more supportive to those who need the extra help. Something that I am um, currently looking at in my educational classes at Central are uh, equity and stuff. So, you know, just making sure everything is equal and equitable for all students. And I think that will go a long way. I will be attending Heritage University in the fall. I am heading into the medical field. Hopefully in two and a half years, I will have my BSN. As my career goals are, I want to be a lawyer for low-income families. Um, my career goal is to become a high school math teacher. And I was homeless for like six years. And I like missed half of my high school years and my middle school and some of my elementary. And... I just graduated high school. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide, please, Aubrey. I, I don't know if I can speak for everyone here. I know for me, um, I get energy hearing those stories um, and hearing about the successes that are possible amidst um, incredible challenges. So thank you for listening. So this slide was included in the video, um, and this is national data. So you can see very clearly the disproportionality that students of color experience homelessness as compared to their white peers. Here in Washington, the data is a little different. Um, similar, students that are identify or are categorized as Black or African American, Native students and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are the three groups most likely to experience homelessness. Um, and we have to recognize also there's many or much more nuance um, than the federal race and ethnicity categories reflect. Um, and as we talk with districts and talk with liaisons, often we disaggregate data for all students, but not as much um, for our McKinney Event eligible students specifically. Uh, next slide, please. So it's important to recognize as we're looking at this disproportionality, students and families are not the deficit. What we are seeing in the data is systems that are not meeting their needs, um, both within our school systems, but also in our larger supports in society or lack thereof. So this question is one that we ask of all of our homeless student stability program grantees um, in their end of year report. What specific actions have you and your district colleagues taken to help close opportunity gaps for students of color experiencing homelessness? Who is being served by the program? It may well be that your enrollment and who is actually being served are drastically different. And when those gaps do exist, why? And who are we engaging with um, to learn about the why? What do our students, families, coworkers, partners tell us? And how do we then commit to the change based on what we learn from them? Next slide, please. So 
So some of you may have um, taken part in a webinar we did last month on the new data dashboard and its use as a racial equity tool. So this is one snapshot where we can see um, already students experiencing homelessness are far more likely than their housed peers to be suspended or expelled from school. There are already racial gaps, but when you compound those by a combination, we see there is a major gap highlighted here for students who identify as Black or African American who are also experiencing homelessness and really kind of the shocking likelihood that they'll be suspended or excluded from school. So diving into that data helps us to recognize um, that we're not interpreting that disaggregated data as a dysfunction of students, but of our practice and of support. And that can help guide us to what our next steps will be and what our responsibilities are as practitioners. Next slide, please. Finally, well, finally today, but really the beginning of our work together. This is a quote from uh, Isabel Wilkerson. So if you're not familiar, she's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, she wrote The Warmth of Other Suns, but most recently, Cast. And she was asked about taking responsibility for racism um, in a recent interview for folks who uh, can't see their direct connection to it. Quote, if you buy an old house, you're not responsible for how it was built. You did not build the beams and the posts and the pillars and the joints that may be now askew. But it's your responsibility once it's in your possession to know what it is that you now occupy and it's your responsibility to fix it. And that is our charge. It's our responsibility as an agency to support this work, both for ourselves and for the state. And we hope you'll take on that responsibility um, to partner with us as we move forward. So thank you again for the work that you're doing day to day, tremendous work to support students and families and for the work to come. Beautiful, thank you so much, Dr. Matt, for bringing that to, um, to this space today and sharing that with all of us. And um, so with all of the information that we've already taken in this morning, I encourage you to um, consider, it, consider it all um, as a way of setting the stage for the rest of the day's events. So having said that, we'll take a quick look at the agenda. Um, we have talked a little bit about our learning objectives for, for the day and moved through a few activities and setting the stage for the day. Um, we now are gonna move into a time where we are really getting down to talking about the nuts and bolts of uh, responsibilities and rights for students who are experiencing homelessness, um, who are McKinney-Vento eligible. Um, after that, we'll take a, a quick break and you'll have an opportunity to stretch and move around and relax. We'll come back and continue our uh, conversation and within the nuts and bolts of McKinney-Vento. Um, then we'll have an opportunity to break out. So you will have then an opportunity to move into a breakout room with um, other attendees and just discuss, there won't be a prompt, there won't be a task or homework for you to bring back to the collective group. This is really your time to connect with one another and talk about the things that you heard this morning. Um, after you've had the breakout session, we're gonna move into our lunch break directly after, after the breakout time in which we will leave your breakout rooms open so that you can grab your lunch or take care of yourself and come back in if you like into the breakout rooms for further opportunity to uh, talk with each other. Um, perhaps formulate questions and uh, talk about ways that maybe you've implemented some of the things you're going to hear this morning into the work that you've already done. This is peer sharing opportunity for you all to come together as a community and enjoy that time together during lunch. Um, after lunch, when we return, we'll have a little uh, message, a brief message from Elmo, and then 
we are going to have an opportunity for everyone who uh, you are hearing from this morning to be available to you, to all of us collectively, for a Q&A session, and that will be open. You'll have the opportunity then to uh, ask questions. You'll be able to raise your hand, and we'll open your mic, and you can speak, and we'll also be watching and monitoring the chat box at that time to address some of your questions as well. Um, after that time, we will hear from our, our guest panelists, and they will each uh, talk about their programs um, as resources for you. And then we'll have another break time after that. Uh, we will come back again as a large group where you will have another opportunity to ask our afternoon panelists questions and receive answers from them. Uh, we'll review our learning objectives to ensure that we've met them for the day, offer some final thoughts and reflections. And, uh, and then we'll close for the day. So that is what the rest of this day is looking like. So again, lots of information to move through and we're just gonna dive right in. Next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna begin this section of talking about McKinney-Vento is first considering the why. And so just uh, to offer a little background for those of you who may be new to McKinney-Vento, um, it was initially an act and it is in place to ensure that uh, our students who are experiencing homelessness have access to uh, continuity and stability um, so it was based on a law that was initially passed in 1987, uh, and there have been updates. It has evolved since then. Uh, there is a, um, it is a federal, it is based on a federal mandate, and the act is authorized uh, was authorized at $85 million. And uh, for the fiscal year of 2020, appropriation was at $101.5 million. And slide, please. So in other words, in terms of um, you know, why McKinney-Vento, why do we do this? So we do this to ensure that students experiencing homelessness um, can enjoy the same rights as house students um, in regard to their educational as well as their extracurricular continuity. Um, they have a right to access and uh, it is our role and responsibility to ensure that they enjoy those rights. Next slide, please. So some of the rights, um, specifically when we talk about continuity, um, include prompt identification as being students experiencing homelessness. Uh, they have a right to receive immediate enrollment, and that is uh, true whether or not uh, access to records that are normally required are available. Uh, full participation in all school activities, um, in terms of any state or standardized testing um, or other standards uh, that are upheld for house students. The ability to remain in their school of origin and according to the student's best interest, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, these students have the right to supportive services and that does include transportation, tutoring and other services as well. And they're eligible for free meals and all Title I services. Slide please. So by definition, when we ask ourselves, um, so when we say students who are experiencing homelessness, what do we mean? Who are we talking about? So by definition, we're talking about children and youth who may be unaccompanied, who lack, who would be, um, who lack a fixed, regular and adequate nighttime residence. And that includes children as well as youth who are, and slide please. So these students, um, maybe sharing housing with other people, and it could be due to their uh, uh, having lost their own. So they may have been housed at one time and then lost their housing due to economic um, hardship or other reasons. They may be living in hotels or motels or trailer parks or campgrounds, uh, transitional or emergency uh, shelters. 
They could have uh, been in, uh, left in hospitals or living in public or private places that are not normally designed for human uh, for humans to live in. Uh, they could be in cars, parks, public spaces, and they could be migratory children who do qualify because of their um, living circumstances. So really um, children and youths who are experiencing homelessness, it doesn't look one way. It could be a, a multiple, uh, it could be for multiple reasons and it could uh, include multiple scenarios. Next slide, please. So uh, one thing we do wanna make sure that you are aware of, if you're not already, that uh, that HUD and the Department of Education and McKinney Vento, um, while we do all recognize uh, children and youth uh, who are experiencing homelessness is a constant, is a reality and uh, Serve and uh, resources are available. At the same time, there are some subtle differentiations between definitions. So for um, McKinney Vento, uh, unsheltered locations, emergency shelters and, and transitional housing, hotels and motels, uh, or families might be doubled up. In terms of Department of Education's definition and uh, scenarios, uh, it is true, unsheltered locations qualifies a student if they are in emergency shelters or transitional housing, that is also true, as well as hotels and motels, um, specifically if it is due to lack of adequate accommodations. And then again, if families are, uh, or students are doubled up or families are doubled up, the answer is yes, they would still qualify under the definition of uh, according to the Department of Education, if it is due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or similar reasons. And then for HUD, uh, similarly, um, unsheltered locations, absolutely. Emergency shelters and transitional housing, yes. Hotels and motels, yes, those students and families would qualify if uh, paid for by government or charity or funds. Um, coming from an external resource. And then if a family is doubled up under, uh, by HUD definition, that is true only under extremely narrow and specific conditions. And so this is just uh, sort of overview information about some of the variances between definitions of homelessness, according to the three entities. The next slide, please. So when we talk about unaccompanied youth, uh, again, many of you are familiar with that, um, with that term, and we just wanna make sure that we are all on the same page and in the same place in terms of our understanding of what we mean when we uh, refer to unaccompanied youth. So by definition, uh, unaccompanied youth includes any child or youth regardless of age. So it could be an infant and it could be a high school student who meets the McKinney-Vento definition of homel homelessness and is not in physical custody of a parent or a guardian. And slide please. So again, we have uh, voices directly from youths who have um, experienced homelessness and they have, uh, they would like to share their story with you. When I was homeless, I actually did not really tell anyone, but only due to the fact that I didn't really consider myself homeless. I, I didn't know I was homeless. I kind of, it just, I thought it was normal and everybody lived this way. I didn't really tell anyone because nobody asked. The reason why I told them is because I was really in, I was really stuck and I needed help. I needed adult help. I couldn't do everything on my own as, as a 15 or 14 year old. How am I supposed to go up to them and spill my life in front of them into their hands and hope that they care? Let parents and youth know that, like, I don't know, homeless is, like, 
It's okay to get help. If a student is acting out and or, and or constantly absent, you know, I think they need to recognize the sign of what an unaccompanied homeless youth looks like. And I don't really think homelessness is something that's on the radar for most high school students. So even just bringing it up um, and letting students know that it is an issue and you are aware of it, that helps open open the door for conversation. To open your eyes and ask for people, ask them how they're doing genuinely. Kind of let them know that, you know, it's a safe place and it's a safe community. And like when they're ready to share whatever's going on, you're ready to listen. Like if you see a student that's struggling or you think they might be struggling, ask them, you know, because worst case scenario, they're not and you misinterpret, you misinterpreted. That's it. And best case scenario, they are struggling and you just gave them a lifeline. But it doesn't really work unless the student wants to. And I feel like a lot of that has to do with trust. so cool to think about how I was living in a tent at a time and now I'm graduating high school or I graduated high school and I'm going to college like it's just mind-blowing and it's with the help of the school so yes the importance of recognizing um, who our students are who um, could be identified as uh, students experiencing homelessness and the impact that you have on uh, potentially changing the tra trajectory of their futures. Um, and it's, a pow it's powerful to hear directly from the students. And so we thank Schoolhouse Connection for their partnership in, uh, so that we could share that video with you. So um, just briefly going through some data, you did see some data on that slide and also Dr. Matt shared some data with us this morning, but um, just generally speaking, 62% um, of McKinney-Vento students said that proof of residency requirements uh, created a barrier, a challenge for them when enrolling in a new school. 56% said that uh, lack of cooperation between their old school in terms of the transfer of records and so forth uh, also created an obstacle for them. And 60% uh, had said that uh, they found that changing schools was difficult to navigate. So again, um, the more that we understand and the more that you all uh, feel that you have access to the resources um, and the information available to support students when they're coming in or transitioning through your, your districts um, and are in need of support, um, the better off these students and all of us will collectively be. And so these statistics were taking, taken from uh, an organization, an article from an organization called America's Promise Alliance. And the article is called Hidden in Plain Sight. And next slide, please. So in Washington state, our most updated information is uh, based on um, October 1 enrollment. You can see the numbers there are very large in terms of our student population and the, um, the percentage of students who reported as experiencing homelessness in 2018 and 19 is uh, or was 3.5% and that's a very significant number within our state. And slide please. 
And then for Washington State, uh, in terms of nighttime residents and um, students or families who are doubled up, 75% of those students who reported uh, as experiencing homelessness um, had reported that they are uh, doubled up with other families. And then you can see from the breakdown of percentages there, uh, what those scenarios were according to um, our database. And then the graduation rate, of course, uh, for all students, according to those same uh, statistics is that 80% of all students, 80.8% 80, 80 of students in Washington state uh, graduated, but those who were experiencing homelessness, uh, that graduation rate is significantly lower. However, the dropout rate is significantly higher. All students, 11.2%, whereas students experiencing homelessness, uh, that rate is at 28%. Next slide, please. At the national level, according to the National Center for Homeless Education, 1.5 million is the number of students enrolled in school and experiencing homelessness. Um, we have several other resources which you will have access to uh, at the end of this training. Um, actually, at the end of the December training, you'll all be sent um, the links and resources that you're seeing here today. So please don't feel pressured to try to capture it all now. But this is really just an overview for you. 25% of our LGBTQ plus uh, homeless youth who reported being rejected or kicked out of their homes um, resulting in homelessness. And, um, and that is from, you can see the resource here in the link. 87% uh, of homelessness is associated with an 87% higher likely dropout rate. And that again is from an article called Don't Call Them Dropouts from America's Promise Alliance. And so as you can see, there are a number of resources where you can gather statistics at both the state and national level, and they're all consistently um, telling us that uh, we are talking about a very vulnerable population of our student community and uh, significantly uh, impacted by uh, homelessness. Next slide, please. So uh, at this time, we're gonna move into an uh, area where we are gonna talk about uh, your responsibilities, key responsibilities as liaisons and within your district, what your responsibilities are, what some of the students' rights are. And um, so to begin that conversation, we are going to welcome our program manager of our McKinney-Vento program in our homeless education department of OSPI, Melinda Dyer. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Aubrey, can you do the next slide, please? All right, first of all, welcome to everyone. It's nice to see so many participants on today's webinar. I noticed lots of names that I recognize and a lots of new liaisons, so that is great. I'm just happy to, to be here to help out. So when you think about your role as a liaison, um, just in your head, I'd like you to sort of think about how did you become the liaison? Every school district in the state, actually every school district in the country is required to have a local education liaison that serves students experiencing homelessness. Sometimes uh, the liaison is designated in their role by an administrator Sometimes the liaison is an administrator. Sometimes the liaison has the luxury of applying for the job because they really want to do this work and they're excited to do it. And other times we know that liaisons might have just been told, by the way, we have this extra job and you're the one. And so we want to be um, understanding of all the different ways that you've come to this work. Uh, because we know the liaison role is very important. There's a lot of work involved in it and uh, we wanna be there to support you. Liaisons have to be able to carry out 10 specific duties that are outlined in federal law. It's not very often when you come into a, the, a federal law where you have a job description basically written for you in the law. But in McKinney-Vento, that's basically what we have. 
we have two very good resources um, and the links are there. One of them is a new resource that was contracted with the National Center for Homeless Education. And it's a great resource talking about the best practices around designating and supporting a local liaison in a school district. And the other one is an issue brief talking about the role and responsibility of local liaisons. If you're interested, there are the links there that will be available to you. Next slide, Aubrey. So key responsibilities that are outlined in the law, and there are many. Um, first of all, the school district has to designate a local liaison, that's paramount. And then after that, the hard work begins. So as a liaison, the paramount role of the liaison is to identify students who are experiencing homelessness, which is not necessarily an easy task. It really depends on uh, the community, the resources, your key partners, how you're going to go about that. Generally speaking, school districts use a housing questionnaire that is available to all families in the entire district, and it is routinely sent out multiple times through the year to ensure that families whose housing status may have changed during the course of the year don't fall through the cracks. Uh, they're eligible for immediate enrollment, even if they don't have any of the normal records that would be required for enrollment for students. If you think about uh, your job in the district or if, if you're a parent and you think about what kinds of things are normally asked for when I enroll my child you think gosh you know birth certificate or uh, utility bill all these different things students experiencing homelessness do not need to show that type of evidence in order to be immediately enrolled and have services set up for them the dispute resolution is another piece that is responsible uh, responsibility of the district and uh, Keith Woodruff will talk about the dispute process a little bit later in today's presentation. Every state has to have a dispute process so that if there is um, any disagreement between the family and the school district about the designation of being eligible for McKinney Vento or any of the enrollment pieces, access to transportation, if there's disputes about any of those things, there is a process in place to allow families to have a voice. School districts are required to remove barriers and update policies and provide meaningful parent involvement, more so than just saying, do you want to come in and volunteer once in a while? Really need to uh, do a lot of outreach, a lot of connection with families to make them feel welcome and key partners in the work. Next slide. More responsibilities. So when we talk about ensuring visibility and accessibility of information, it's actually written into the federal law that school districts must post the rights of homeless students throughout the school district in all school buildings and throughout the community. And community partners are very important in this work to help with identification. And so uh, brochures, flyers, posters, all of those things should be in local food banks, community bulletin boards, post offices, uh, hotels, if that's available, if you have long-term uh, long rental hotels, camping grounds. Uh, in our state, we've had some really creative uh, ways when uh, that districts have put that information out to communities. And I would really urge you, because we are in a pandemic, to make sure that that information is readily available throughout the community and not just in the schools because a lot of schools are not uh, really open right now and families might not always want to be uh, coming in and out of the front office for example uh, let's see we talked about barriers already school districts are responsible for ensuring that students that are in uh, high school that are going to be graduating have access to support with fafsa and other resources to ensure that they qualify as independent students on the FAFSA if they're unaccompanied and homeless. We need to work with our early learners as well because McKinney-Vento does apply to preschool students as well as the K-12 population. That set-asides through Title I are provided, which is another requirement. School districts must provide Title I supports to their students uh, that are experiencing homelessness because McKinney-Vento funding is very limited and so most districts rely on Title I funding. And the referrals for things such as medical, dental, mental health, housing, all those community supports are also provided to kids and families. Next slide. So when administrators in a district are 
deciding how to fill the role of the liaison, there are many things to look for, including not just the legal requirements of the position, but how many homeless students there are, what is the work going to entail, how many kids are in the district, what are your community demographics. Uh, there's just many things to, to consider. Next slide. U.S. Department of Ed states that the liaison has to have sufficient time to do their jobs effectively and the district needs to support them in fulfilling their duties. This is an outcome from a survey that was done a couple of years ago with our Washington State liaisons and 67 percent of liaisons that responded said they had less uh, four hours or less per week to fulfill all of those duties that we just spoke about and of those 67 percent 15% of the liaisons had one hour or less per week to do staff training, to do identification, enrollment, set up services, and do all of the things that need to be done to support our students experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a reference to a really great tool that is put together by Schoolhouse Connection so that liaisons can do a brief self-assessment of the work that you do, the work that you need to do, and whether you have the time and the resource to get the job done. It's a, it's a helpful self-assessment tool, and so we wanted to include it here. Next slide. So as a liaison, ask yourself, how much time is allocated to your liaison duties? Do you have several hours a week? Do you only have a few minutes per week? Are you able to get the job done? How much time do you really spend? And do you have the capacity and authority to, com to complete your liaison duties? So reflecting on that just for a moment. Next slide, Aubrey. Transportation. We get lots and lots of questions about transportation uh, as it relates to students experiencing homelessness. What you need to know about transportation is that it is a requirement in the federal law. School districts are required to provide or arrange transportation to and from the school of origin, including preschools. And when we talk about school of origin, school of origin is the school where the student was last enrolled or the school they attended when they were last permanently housed. There may be situations with some students where they may have more than one school of origin to choose from, um, which gets into a lot of the tall grass uh, and details, which we won't get into right at this moment. But if you have questions, please let me know and we can get back to you. So the school of origin uh, transportation has to be included uh, and provided until the end of the school year when a student gets permanent housing or if they are continue to remain homeless, these services stay in place for the duration of homelessness. Next slide. So if a student, uh, what happens with a student who is living in one school district and attending school in another school district, the requirement is that both districts work together to apportion the cost and responsibility for the student's transportation. And that if they can't agree, then they split those costs equally. But the district that is actually enrolling the student takes the lead on making uh, the decisions around transportation. They work together with the neighboring district and they come up with something that will work for everyone, hopefully. Um, transportation can be expensive. It can be difficult to arrange, especially in our rural remote areas. Uh, it continues to be probably the biggest challenge that school districts experience when serving homeless students is the provision of transportation. Next slide. Additionally, uh, it's important to know that transportation must be provided to extracurricular activities. So for example, if you have a student who is experiencing homelessness and they want to be on the football team, but they have a difficult time getting back and forth to practices or to games, the district needs to address that barrier. And if, the, if that means providing the transportation for that student, then that's what needs to happen. Um, even if it may not be available to all other students, sometimes things for homeless students must be provided such as extracurricular uh, transportation. Students who are uh, in preschools also are eligible for transportation. We know that students who uh, 
are getting transportation, it needs to be comparable as well. And that doesn't always mean the same as, but comparable would be, let's say, for example, um, it might be a district has a student who is a uh, might need an hour long bus ride and someone in the district might push back against that and they say, well, that's way too, that's too long, it's too far. If there are other students in the district that are also on the bus or getting services that are similar, then you must provide that also to your homeless students. There is no distance, no time limit, and no cost limit that is written into the law that puts parameters around transportation. There's nothing that says, if you've gone this many extra miles, you don't have to do it. That's not a thing. Um, transportation must be provided. And if the district has determined that the student's best interest is for them to remain in that school, transportation has to be arranged or provided, uh, which can be challenging, but that's, that's what the law uh, provides for these students for school stability. Next slide. So during uh, the COVID shutdowns, this is just a side note because I know we need to move forward. The federal law has not changed. Districts that are enrolling homeless students and serving homeless students need to continue providing transportation. They still need to immediately enroll students and serve students. If the students are in a hybrid model or in a remote learning model, they have the same options as housed students. If a hybrid or in-person uh, situation is occurring, the school is required to transport the student from to and from school of origin, even if the student is located out of the district. And if there's a dispute, then there's a dispute uh, process that students can go through after the transportation has been set up. The dispute process uh, works itself out while the student is enrolled and receiving services. We've had a few situations this year when we've had some districts who've said, for example, I have an out of district student and uh, we don't believe that we should be transporting out of district students into our district. This is for homeless students, the federal law has not changed and the district is still required to provide services for students if they are uh, receiving services in your district and the transportation needs to be provided. I hope that makes sense. Next slide. Uh, on the OSPI website, there's a transportation toolkit with sample forms and documents that can support you in this work. If you need to look them up, there's the link. And there are also forms on the OSPI website for housing questionnaires, intake forms, uh, child fine notices, a variety of different forms and documents in multiple languages and they should be pretty helpful to you. Next slide. Uh, and then we're gonna turn it over to Matt Smith here. Thank you, Melinda. So you heard quite a bit about federal law and policy and building points of contact are part of state law. So the same law that created the Homeless Student Stability Program in 2016 also included this requirement uh, for certain schools. And as of 2019, um, all elementary, middle and high schools are required to designate. As far as we know, we're the only state in the nation um, that has this requirement, though there are other states, including California and Texas, they're recommended as a best practice. So uh, you'll see there's four key roles here. Um, and the way I remember them as a mnemonic is CLIP coordinate, lead, inform, and provide. So the principal designates the building point of contact, although often this is just shining a light on work that's already happening. So rather than an additional responsibility where, well, who is the person already? Often it's a counselor, a teacher, a social worker, though it could be a, a parapro or admin support. Really the person that uh, cares deeply about supporting students experiencing homelessness and can build trusting relationships with students, families, and colleagues. Um, so the district liaison is responsible for training the building points of contact. Uh, though really right now, when we're not in buildings mostly, it's essentially a school point of contact. Um, and ultimately that person needs to have not necessarily the same level of knowledge as the district liaison, but to know enough about how to identify, how to share that information and practice with their colleagues across the school uh, to be able to often provide that uh, intake. Many times 
the person who, the point of contact at the school is gonna have a better relationship than someone at the district, depending at the size of the district. Um, and so that close coordination with the district liaison is essential to this role. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the other requirements in the law is for us to make available best practices for choosing and training. So on our website, we have some really basic information about uh, how to do this. And we are also gonna be rolling out um, training in the first quarter of 2021, both live and our first asynchronous training for our team via Moodle. And so there'll be more to come on that. All right, and next slide, please. Okay, back to a couple of items around enrollment uh, before our break. So preschoolers, we do get questions about preschoolers and they are included and protected under the McKinney-Vento Act. Preschoolers do now with reauthorization have the right to school of origin. In the past, that was not uh, considered to be an issue for preschoolers, but now it is. So if a student who's in preschool has been attending preschool and they move, they have the right to remain in the preschool where they were previously attending if it's in their best interest and the district would be providing uh, transportation and so forth. Uh, in, immediate enrollment applies to preschools. Preschool students experiencing homelessness can be prioritized on wait lists if it turns out that the preschool is full, for example, if the classrooms are full. Um, homeless students should be prioritized uh, in a variety of ways and that can happen either with public preschools or with Head Start and ECAP programs and other uh, preschools that might be associated with the school. Some preschool programs hold slots open for McKinney-Vento eligible students and the state plan uh, for McKinney-Vento describes procedures that, enroll, uh, that ensure that enrolled homeless children have access to public preschool programs. Next slide. So sometimes we get questions about Head Start and Early Head Start and ECAP programs and the district will need to determine or the liaison will need to determine if the preschool is operated by the school district. If the preschool is operated by the school district, then McKinney-Vento applies. If the preschool is not operated by the school district, then McKinney-Vento probably does not apply. And when we talk about preschools, that could be any preschool program, but generally it's the three to five year old group. Um, there are also preschool programs for special education. There's a variety of different components to preschool and we have some uh, resources for you to help you out with that. Next slide. Uh, so for early childhood uh, homelessness and some resources for birth to five, I would direct folks to Schoolhouse Connection. We can answer your questions about preschools a little bit later and I apologize for the rush, but we also want to make sure that you have your break on time and that we get back on the agenda. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Sharon to take you to your break. And I ask that you, if you have questions, save them up and hopefully we can get to everything during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melinda and um... Dr. Matt and everyone who shared. We are gonna move into our break time now for 15 minutes. So we will return at 11.45. And uh, at that time, we'll we will welcome Sarah Weiss. She is the Associate Director of College Access and Support. She'll be talking about post-secondary opportunities um, and supports available for our students who are experiencing homelessness. So please take care of yourselves and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Sharon, do you wanna take attendance now? to remind you or to let you know that we took attendance during break. So if you left during break and you're returning, please indicate in the chat box that um, you're returning from break and you would like your attendance to be um, noted so that we can count you and you will receive your clock hours and or uh, so that we can know that you're here with us today. So. Um, again, just a reminder if you're if you were here 
prior to break and you left to take care of yourself and came back into uh, the Zoom room, uh, please indicate that in the chat box so we can capture you for attendance purposes. And with that, we are gonna move forward. Um, next, we are gonna hear from Sarah Weiss. She is the Associate Director of College Access and Support. Good morning and welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, it's so uh, wonderful to be here this morning with you all. Um, again, as Sharon noted, my name is Sarah Weiss. Uh, Weiss is nice, you can remember me that way and our presentation this morning. Um, I work at the Washington Student Achievement Council. Um, and for those of you who don't know, just a quick note about who we are. We are a state agency that supports um, transition points from way down to working with students and families in the college savings programs, up to um, working with financial aid for students who need access to those resources um, to go to college. And so we, we really focus on those transition ports, points and supporting um, students uh, through the post-secondary education um, and apprenticeship programs that they may be interested in pursuing um, after high school and, and as an adult. Next slide, please. So um, in my time this morning, what I'm going to cover, um, just a oh, very high level overview of general financial aid um, information, just so we're all kind of on the same page when we're talking about financial aid. I'm going to speak uh, for a moment as well about the Passport to Careers program specifically. And then finally, I'll talk about our 12th year campaign and other resources that are available to you, um, community-based organizations, school folks, liaisons, um, anyone who's working with students and their families about um, post-secondary opportunities. Next slide, please. So a quick note about me before we jump into the financial aid uh, information is I love the metaphor of using an umbrella. Um, I, I talk about it a lot. Maybe it's because I grew up in Eastern Washington and when I moved to Western Washington, I'm one of the few who actually uses one still. Um, but financial aid is an umbrella term. There's not one type of financial aid. Uh, financial aid is broken into four main categories that students will have access. Students have, may have access to different components of them. Grant scholarship, loans, and work study. Um, the grant programs, the largest grant program in our state of Washington is the Washington College Grant. And this program was recently expanded. The income eligibility was expanded, meaning more students are eligible for more types of funding um, to pursue more opportunities post uh, graduation and as an adult. Um, this covers over 60 uh, colleges and universities here in Washington state, our community and technical colleges system, private career colleges, public four-year, private four-year, two-year system schools, lots of different opportunities um, for students to use Washington College Grant. Um, it also covers apprentice registered apprenticeship programs too to help students with funding if they're interested in going into an apprenticeship program. The other big program that you may be familiar with is the College Bound Scholarship. That's a scholarship program, a state grant program that students need to have signed up in middle school for that. Um, unless they're uh, uh, dependent of the state of Washington, they can be auto enrolled throughout um, high school as well. But College Bound Scholarship covers um, some additional funds uh, in addition to what the Washington College Grant covers, which is the full tuition um, at, a public at public rates. So there are scholarships uh, that organizations will offer to students. Many of your school districts, I'm sure, offer scholarships and foundations as well. Um, student loans, uh, as well as work study, which allows students to work while earning um, aid to go to college or uh, their program. Uh, we are one of the few states in the country that offers a state work study program in addition to the federal work study program as well. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the fi that financial aid is an umbrella uh, of uh, lots of different types of programs to help students through um, college, uh, we think now, well, how do they access them? And the first step is applying for aid. Um, we refer to this as the rule of one here in Washington. We actually have two applications for financial aid that students may use, but they really only need to do one. Uh, the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. 
That's the federal form. Um, this application is for students who are eligible for federal state fi federal financial aid, meaning they're U.S. citizens, uh, permanent residents, for example. Uh, applying with the FAFSA application will also apply students for uh, state financial aid, like I mentioned, college bound scholarship, Washington College grant, etc. So students who are inter who are U.S. citizens or permanent residents um, should be applying for financial aid using the FAFSA. FAFSA.gov will get them there. Um, for students in Washington who meet state residency requirements but are not eligible for federal programs due to immigration status, um, a lot of times we're referring here to our undocumented student population. They meet, may meet state residency requirements for programs such as Washington College Grant, College Bound Scholarship, et cetera. Um, they should apply for state financial aid with the Washington application for state financial aid, WASFA. And that's available on our website, readysetgrad.org slash WASFA. Um, but again, students should only do one application. They do not need to do two. Um, they should only do one application, uh, whichever is the right for them. Now, a good best practice when helping students figure out um, which application, if you're unsure of, for a student, um, we never want to make assumptions on which is the right application for a student. Um, we have on the readysetgrad.org slash WASFA website um, a brief questionnaire, a quiz that will help students figure out which application is right for them. So if you're unsure, uh, if the student's unsure which application to, to complete, send them to that website um, or help them navigate it and it will uh, help them determine which application is right for them. Next slide, please. So we talked about what, with the umbrella of financial aid from your Eastern Washington uh, friend here, um, the, that financial aid is an umbrella. We talked about the how to apply with the FAFSA or the WASFA. Now we wanna talk about the when. The FAFSA and WASFA open in October, both of them open October 1st. Um, students should apply uh, the year before they're going to go to college. So if you're working with seniors right now who want to attend um, college uh, programs next year um, as, a, as a freshman, um, they should apply, uh, they should be applying right now. It opened in October, uh, October 1st. Um, each college and university will have its own deadlines, um, and to, which can be a little difficult to navigate, but I'd say our, our colleagues at the college and universities have, have lots of good resources and support for students in helping them understand what their deadlines are. Um, but the sooner the better. Um, as I said, it opened October 1st and students can begin applying for financial aid. Now I'm going to start talking about um, some programs specifically for um, unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, I'm going to talk about passport program, the passport program, but before we jump into that, can I have the next slide please? I wanted to give you a sense, this is a slide that actually has some college data on it. I wanted to give you a sense of how um, students are identified um, as uh, homeless use or, or uh, unaccompanied homeless use specifically, because they are able to file the financial aid application as an independent, independent student, meaning that parent information, uh, financial information would not be required. Um, and so you'll see that a lot of students, the financial aid application will help to help a college determine that student self identification. It may come from the admissions office or a referral um, working with you all as McKinney Vento liaisons, um, helping students get that verification as needed. Um, and so know that again, students who are unaccompanied homeless youth can, can apply for financial aid as independent students. Um, but they may need your help in helping to confirm that. Next slide, please. So the passport program um, has had several iterations over the last several years, a lot of expansion to it. It used to be specifically only for former foster youth, um, but now it uh, supports unaccompanied homeless youth as well. There are two types of programs within the passport program. There's passport to college, which support, provides um, funding to go to a college program. Um, there's not just funding, but supports on campus. If a college wants to support and receive passport funds, they have to commit to supporting students 
um, with wraparound services as well. So Passport to College is one um, component of the Passport to, uh, to Careers program. The other is the Passport to Apprenticeship Opportunities. This is the newest, it's only a couple of years old. Um, this provides career-related training under registered apprenticeship uh, programs uh, and um, works with a, a company that, that helps us determine those uh, apprenticeship programs. And um, so again, Passport is a fantastic program if you're working with unaccompanied homeless youth because it doesn't just provide funding, it provides some wraparound services to support students um, through the college and apprenticeship program. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So an additional how that I wanted to share is our resource, which is our 12th year campaign. Uh, many of your schools and districts may already be engaged with the 12th year campaign or, or you might as well. Um, the goal of our campaign is to provide free materials, training, resources. We have videos on our website around financial aid. We can order hard copy workbooks, flyers, postcards. Um, we've got activities online that can be used now in our virtual environment, but also those hard copy materials as well. Um, there are three ways schools and districts can participate. It's really customizable to your needs. If you simply wanna organ, uh, order materials to give out to students so that you're not having to recreate the reel around financial aid and college application information, you can do that. If you want support in having events, uh, whether they're virtual, um, at this point, um, most of our state events are virtual right now. Um, we can help you in supporting those as well. The 12th year campaign um, also manages an online portal where you as district and school staff can see student level FAFSA completion status. So if you're working with a student and you wanna confirm that they did the FAFSA and it was completed successfully, you can do that as well um, through the portal. And on that website that's listed on the, the, the slide there is where you can get all of this information. It's um, designed to be supportive of the new financial aid advising day requirement and really um, help uh, schools and districts um, have it, access to consistent, accurate uh, resources for free. Next slide, please. Otterbot is our texting service. It's designed to help students. It focuses on college bound students, but any student can text into it. It uh, provides timely uh, nudges as well as interactive text campaigns to students who are looking for help around the financial aid process. Um, you can, students can text in 24, um, 24 seven. Uh, it's a, a bot that we manage. And then if they do ask a question that uh, you know, isn't uh, quite up for the bot's uh, technology brain, it gets forwarded on to us and we help the student as well. Um, right now for the class of 2021, we're supporting about 14,500 students, but again, any student can text into the OtterBot um, platform by saying, hi Otter, to that number below. Um, we found that, uh, you know, it's been a really cool tool to help reach students where they're at a little bit more. We also provide uh, email lists as what well, email list serves, but we found a lot more engagement with the tech service since we started it last fall. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a brief uh, one, a mention of federal resources at the studentaid.gov website. Um, but a brief screenshot of uh, working with students um, who are experiencing homelessness um, through the financial aid process. Uh, this was a pretty helpful resource I found, pretty comprehensive uh, that I wanted to point out as well. So studentaid.gov is a federal site that has lots of good resources in addition to the 12th year campaign, which is going to be something that we run here in the state of Washington. So next slide, please. And again, just a reminder, I'm Sarah Weiss. Weiss is nice. I'm happy to always answer any questions, point you in the right direction, help you find a resource. That's our WASAC, uh, Washington Student Achievement Council website on their my direct uh, email address. And um, I want to thank uh, Sharon and the OSPI team so very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all this morning. Um, well, I've now headed right into the afternoon. So this afternoon, I can say officially. Um, and I will be back at 1.15 for the Q&A as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Invaluable, invaluable information that I know our participants will uh, take back to their schools 
and be able to implement if they're not already doing so with the students that they're serving. So thank you so much. So now we're gonna move into uh, talking about a little bit about funding streams. We'll start with McKinney Vento. And again, welcoming back Melinda Dyer. Hello, uh, as far as McKinney Vento goes, uh, there is some money available to assist school districts in supporting their students who are experiencing homelessness. So I'll just cover a little bit of information about that funding source and how you can apply for it. So- Melinda, I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me better now? Much better, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so McKinney-Vento grant funding is a federal funding source and each year Washington State receives uh, a new allocation from U.S. Department of Ed, and that this year was about $1.5 million from U.S. Department of Education. Most of those funds go directly to school districts in the form of grants. Currently, we have 37 local sub-grants. Uh, 35 of those are individual districts. They're all posted on the OSPI website if you're curious which districts. And two of those programs are consortia programs. One of them is a three-district program, and the other one is a seven-district program. The grants are not huge uh, because you can imagine Imagine with 40,000 homeless students in the state, uh, that amount of money is not going to go very far, unfortunately. But it does provide a great support for those districts in its supplemental. And so they're already using, all districts should already be using Title I funds to support their homeless students. And then this additional McKinney-Vento funding is really supplemental. I like to think of it like a cupcake. And if you've heard me speak before, you probably remember this analogy. So all students get the cupcake and that would be the equivalent of basic education funding. And then students who qualify get frosting and that would be the Title I funding. And then the sprinkles on the top would be the McKinney-Vento grant funding that is really supplemental and it's just an additional fund source to help students uh, receive those really intensive supports that are needed and districts can provide those. All districts must follow McKinney-Vento whether or not they receive funding. Um, and so it's really important to remember that that Title I set aside that you're gonna hear about a little bit later is really critical and districts need to be very thoughtful about assessing what their students need, how much it costs, and that should be the driver for how much money they're setting aside from their Title I funds to specifically support their students that are experiencing homelessness. But this McKinney-Vento grant funding is a grant that is offered every three years. It is competitive. We try to fund as many of the applicants as we possibly can with the amount of money that we have. Typically grants run from $25,000 to $55,000 per district and the next grant cycle will be in the spring of 2022. So we are right in the middle of a three year grant cycle right now. But if it's of interest to you and you want information about how to apply through our online grant application process, please just let me know. You might want to start gathering data and information now um, so that you have your thoughts in order when the application gets uh, ready to be put out there in a little over a year. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide. And that would be Matt Smith, over to you. Thank you, Melinda. So I see in the chat, um, our colleague, Sarah Miller, I like that analogy of um, the cherry on top is HSSEP. So this is another state program, um, state funded, complementary to McKinney-Vento, um, but completely funded by the state legislature. So it's relatively new, just since 2016. And in 2019, there were some additional um, weights given to competitive grant applications around racial equity work, support for unaccompanied homeless youth, and building partnerships with community-based organizations. We talked earlier about the building points of contact component in the legislation. And similarly, uh, we get 1.2 million from the state every year. Uh, we just got a little bit of a bump. And so we've been able to offer the largest amount of grant awards uh, to our current grantees, 876,000. So the grants tend to be a little bit larger than those of McKinney Vento. Um, 75,000 is the median award and we're able to support 
grantees in seven of the nine ESDs across the state. There is a requirement for what the legislature calls geographic diversity. This is also the first time we've offered two-year awards, so provided that the legislature continues the funding into the next biennium, which we fully expect um, will be um, in alignment with the McKinney-Vento grant program competition in 2022. And it's our commitment to streamline those processes. So if you're applying for both, that it's, um, it's as smooth a process as it can be, and we're not duplicating information for our applicants. And with that, we will toss it over to Penelope, our colleague in Title I. Well, thank you very much, Matt and Melinda. This is Penelope Mena, and I am one of the Title I uh, Part A in Learning Assistance Program Supervisors at OSBI. Uh, if after my presentation you still have questions about the Title I homeless set aside, uh, we can assist you, but we would like you to also contact your Title I director or special program director at your district because we do want you to coordinate and make sure that you work together with uh, the staff. And of course, you can contact me at, or you can contact us at the Title I department on the email uh, that is right there on, um, on the slide. And also, I would like to uh, share with you our website if you have additional questions about what is Title I and what it's uh, besides using the, uh, the Title I Part A set aside, homeless set aside. But, can we move on now, please, next to, uh, if we can move on to the next slide. Thank you very much. So the homeless students and Title I Part A set aside. The goal really of the Title I Part A is to ensure that all children have a fair and equal opportunity at academic success. The Title I Part A uh, is this designed really to meet the educational needs of low achieving children in schools with the highest levels of poverty all homeless students are categorically eligible for Title I Part A support and services. There shouldn't be a priority list or designations for homeless students. Services provided through Title I Part A may need to be greater in scope and intensity for homeless students or simply different in type than those normally provided to known homeless students by the Title I Part A um, services. So another thing too is that these funds, the Title I Part A set aside, uh, homeless set aside funds can be used not only on Title I schools, but also in non-title schools. And we have two programs in the Title I, um, in the Title I office, well, not office, I'm actually the, the federal program. And those two uh, programs, the targeted assistance and the school-wide, those also support homeless students as well. Could we move on to the next slide, please? So why, um, why set aside uh, the required set aside for Title I Part A funds, specifically for homeless? So all LEAs that receive Title I Part A funds must reserve that set aside funds necessary to provide homeless children uh, services comparable to services provided in Title I Part A schools. Uh, usually, uh, the amount may be determined based, like Melinda said, on a needs assessment, and it should be involved, and we should, or they, uh, the staff at the district should involve always the liaison, the, the homeless liaison, and all their staff that work directly with homeless students. Amount, uh, the amount must be sufficient to provide comparable services to homeless students, regardless of other services provided with, res with reserve funds. So in the Title I it specifically notes that homeless children are included within the population of students considered to have the greatest need. So that's why that set aside is required. District must set aside an amount appropriate to serve the needs of homeless students. Like I said, the needs assessment should be comprehensive in nature, uh, assessing needs of homeless students across multiple schools in the district. And homeless liaison, Title I directors, the district staff should work collaborative to determine the appropriate amount. Uh, we do have on our application, which uh, your district, uh, there's a district person at each of the uh, LEAs or the districts who is assigned to basically uh, 
complete and submit the Title I uh, form packet to a one application that is the grant application for us. And that person should be uh, responsible for making sure that that needs assessment gets completed. And of course, you know, that the right personnel and the right staff gets um, to uh, collaborate and come together to provide and create that needs assessment for the homeless student. So next slide, please. What are some of the allowable costs for homeless students and, and that you can use uh, for the Title I Part Eight set aside? Uh, these are some of the examples. They're not uh, all, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, this is just the limited list. If when you do get the, um, the full uh, PowerPoint, you will see more on the notes section of other examples as well. But we also want to make sure that you understand that it is really a coordinated effort and that you should know what are the services and resources that you have at your, at your local level, at your, uh, at your school, and also in your community. So that's what we wanna make sure that Title I funds are your last resort and that they're always there to help those Title I um, and non-Title uh, schools to provide services for homeless students. Some of those uh, could be up to 100% of the homeless liaison salary, extended learning time, uh, like, a, like it says here, before and after school, summer school, Saturday school, to compensate for lack of quiet time, for homework, or in shelters, or other disrupting living conditions. Items of clothing necessary to meet the dress code, the uniform requirements, and those are the types of things that go above and beyond um, and that are needed for a student to be fully participant in their, in their education, right? And, and at the school level, of course, um, to be fully participating in the, in the school activities. So those are the kinds of things that you will do differently for a homeless student. Clothing, shoes necessary to participate in PE classes, student fee necessary to participate in the general ed program, personal school supplies, backpacks, notebooks, the birth certificate necessary for enrollment. Um, and like I said, you know, it could be immunization, food, medical and dental, dental services, eyeglasses and hearing aids, counseling services, outreach services to students living in shelters, hotels, et cetera. And I mean, the list goes on. So um, if you do have questions about what type of allowable services you would uh, if you have scenarios or if you have a question, you can always contact, of course, you know, the experts at OSBI would be homeless education. But if you are, you have questions in regards to the title one set aside there, of course, there are the experts. But we also are the second layer or another layer of support uh, that can help you or assist you with, with those questions or scenarios. So um, just to um, part and, and to say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we just want to make sure that, uh, that uh, you know that those uh, funds are available to you and that you can always use them. And uh, you, uh, you can uh, want to make sure that, of course, you look at your needs assessment for homeless students and that you contact and coordinate with your Title I and other staff as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Penelope. And will you be joining us for the Q&A session yes, after so lunch? Yes, Wonderful. of course. Yes, I will be. Thank you so much. And for all of you um, participating, uh, Penelope and the rest of our morning speakers will be available after lunch to answer your question and address uh, thoughts that you may have. And with that moving right along, we are now going to uh, hear about uh, attendance and truancy from Chrissy Johnson. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me and for being here. I am keenly aware I'm standing between you and lunch. And so I am going to go through these slides and just highlight the most, what I think are the most important um, elements. We did a webinar back with the homeless education and foster care team um, that goes into more detail. So I'll be sharing um, that link with you later if you want more details. Um, so um, next slide, please. 
There are two documents, actually three, I want you to know about one. There was an August bulletin. There is a new bulletin coming out this week because we made a key policy change this week that I will talk about in just a second that has still not been broadly communicated to superintendents. So you're getting a sneak peek. Um, that bulletin will come out this week and we will make sure you see it. There is also the attendance and truancy FAQ on our website. I will be sharing those links shortly. Next slide, please. I want to highlight one or two of these guiding principles that are our North Star as we look at our rules and guidance around attendance. The first one I want to highlight for you is the third bullet that we really see absences as a signal that cue us to ask students and families why, what's going on, what can we do, how can we support. And then the fourth bullet too, hearkening back to Dr. Matt Smith's comments earlier today, we see attendance as a signal that really shows us and can highlight system inequities. Where, which, which students, where are our students um, experiencing challenges with our systems? Next slide, please. Uh, you can just go right through these. Um, there's five bullets here and I'm going to quickly go through them in the next slide. So let's just roll on through the slide to the next one, please. Uh, number one, districts should be taking daily attendance, including in each class. If um, there is an expectation for students to be attending a, um, or participating uh, asynchronously in a class. Next slide, please. Another change, we added a definition of participation or attendance in remote learning. And so we've provided a much more flexibility for students to show uh, what attendance is and participation in remote learning. It includes logging into their learning management systems, um, meaningful uh, interaction with their teacher about their course content and evidence of uh, participating in a task or an assignment. Our goal here was to adapt for remote learning um, your district may be operationalizing this differently than other districts because there was flexibility. Um, one key note is that we really um, supported districts, um, encouraged districts to provide not just um, the requirement to attend live Zoom sessions, but the opportunity for students to engage asynchronously outside of school hours. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the big change. Just if you take away one thing from um, this conversation today, uh, know that um, in the fall, we created a new category of absence that was not excused or unexcused. We called it the non-truancy remote learning absence. As of yesterday, we have extended the non-truancy remote learning absence until March 1st, 2021. What this means is that a little bit different from September, Absences from remote learning should not accrue for the filing of a truancy petition and districts should continue to be practicing excusing absences. So your one takeaway, absences from remote learning should not be accruing for the filing of a truancy petition until March 1st, 2021. Next slide. We also added a number of different reasons specific to COVID and remote learning. I will not read through all of these. They are in the WAC, um, but they are helpful information for you to know as you are working with your students that might be identified for truancy actions. Next slide, please. Another element in the rule was to require districts to develop a tiered response system. So if we are not following the truancy actions in the statute, we are asking districts, requiring districts to develop a tiered response that includes daily notification of absences to parents, differ differentiated supports, um, which include universal supports and, and um, more intensive interventions for students that are not participating um, or engaging. Next slide, please. Lastly, lots of questions and um, maybe some confusion about this. We are um, across our agency amplifying the message that because simply because you cannot claim a student for funding does not mean that OSPI requires you or directs you to withdraw them from enrollment. Next slide. 
Um, I'm almost ready to wrap up here. I uh, really appreciate the oppor opportunity to talk with you as um, the experts in your districts supporting youth experiencing homelessness. I also work with a network of truancy liaisons. Some of you are <laughs> the truancy liaisons. So, um, but I wanted to highlight one myth and fact that I have been hearing. Um, one that students experiencing homelessness cannot have a truancy petition filed on them. And the truth is they can. Now we've created this uh, non-truancy remote learning absence. So students in remote learning should not have a truancy petition filed until March 1st. Um, but under other circumstances, uh, there is nothing in our um, statute. And I know that Keith will be um, stepping up right after I'm done here. Um, so he can he can ask answer any questions about that, but that prohibit a student experiencing homelessness from having a petition filed on them. However, um, you're in a unique position to work with your schools and your truancy liaison to help them understand this guidance, especially the reasons around um, excusing absences and the required interventions that are um, that are required before the filing of a truancy petition. Additionally, um, you could ask that you are notified prior to a petition being filed so that you are always aware and that you can help um, verify those absences and you could make sure um, that all of those steps have been followed. And then lastly, um, I'll provide a link to our online um, directory of district truancy liaisons. Uh, great people for you to connect and collaborate with. La uh, next slide, please. I'll put the links to these resources in the chat. Next slide. And here's my contact information. I'll also put these links in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chrissy. I really appreciate uh, your participation and, and invaluable, again, invaluable information for our participants um, and appreciate uh, you moving swiftly and all of our presenters really this morning moving so swiftly through the information. We are on target for in terms of our schedule. So what will happen now is we will hear from Keith Woodruff in regards to uh, uh, disputes, uh, notice and disputes. And then after Keith is finished, we will talk about what our breakout and lunch session will look like. So Keith. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm Keith Woodruff. I'm a Kinney Vento program supervisor. Um, work with Melinda a lot. I like to say I'm one of her minions, um, but the rest of the team is also really fabulous. Um, if you email the homeless ed inbox or you call um, our office, there's a good chance um, that I'm the person that you're going to, to talk to. I, I take a, a majority of those calls. So I'm here to uh, today to talk about disputes. Um, so there's some important takeaways on the, the um, slides that we have, but all the information I'm about to talk about is available in our dispute resolution process or the sample dispute um, process paperwork. Um, and I put that in the chat, but it's also always available on the OSPI Homeless Ed resource page. And it's uh, the ones in the chat are uh, in English, um, but it's also available. Each of them are available in 11 different languages. So you, uh, uh, whatever, whichever one the, the family needs, um, you'll have it there. So the McKinney-Vento Act acknowledges that disputes may arise between the school district and students experiencing homelessness. This is normal. Uh, the act includes dispute resolution among the required duties of the school district liaison. So if that's you, this is your responsibility. So at OSPI, we have developed um, the dispute resolution process as required by the act. It's what I put in the chat. Um, so when you're thinking about disputes, um, you should bear in mind that they should be initiated at the request of the parent or guardian or an unaccompanied, that's legal guardian, that was a question earlier, or unaccompanied youth and not at the request or convenience of the school district. Don't forget that the presumption is always that the, um, it's always going to be that the school where enrollment is sought is in the best interest of the student. So uh, if it's an enrollment issue, the burden is going to be on the district to show otherwise. So every effort must be made to resolve issues with families or with unaccompanied youths by liaisons. So you really like the dispute resolution process should really like be the, the last thing that you're doing because you're really taking it out of the liaison's hands and out of the hands of the family. But if you find yourself disagreeing with a parent or guardian or an unaccompanied youth, um, your first step is to make your initial determination uh, in writing. So the liaison, um, that's a requirement by the act, you put it in writing. And I always um, like to remind liaisons to use student-centered factors. So if you're putting in there that it's more convenient 
or there's difficulty carrying out uh, the matter on the part of the school or the district or that it's super expensive, those are not good reasons. They need to be reasons that are focused uh, on, on the student's experience. Uh, Aubrey, next slide. So the initial uh, liaison's decision, you need to have, as I said, it needs to have written contact information for the homeless liaison and the state coordinator. Um, you have to have a form in there to, for the family to initiate the dispute. Uh, you have to have a description of how to initiate the dispute. You need timelines uh, and a notice that the student uh, will stay enrolled uh, pending the outcome of all appeals up to the OSBI level uh, if needed. The sample paperwork that I've put in there, it, it has all of that in there. So if you just follow that, you'll, you'll be fine. So the family has 15 days to request um, a dispute resolution to the liaison. So if that happens, uh, level one of the appeal is back to the homeless liaison. So it's a little uh, counterintuitive, but you get a second chance um, if you're the liaison to review the decision again, which in a lot of times um, it can be resolved at this level. So you don't, you, you know, it doesn't take it out of your hands right away if there's a dispute uh, initiated by the, um, by the family. So the liaison has five business days to issue their level one decision in writing and they must verify receipt of the decision by the family or unaccompanied youth. So uh, I, I get that question sometimes. Well, we, we haven't been able to make sure that they've gotten a copy of it. Is timeline, has it started yet? No, you have to make sure that they actually receive a copy of it. So the information uh, that you give them should include information on filing a level two appeal. Uh, and then they have 10 days to, to do that um, if that's what they wanna do. So the level two appeal is the first point uh, in the process that uh, takes it out of the, hand of the hands of the liaison, uh, and that's to your school district superintendent. So what the liaison should give the a superintendent to make the decision is a copy of the parent or unaccompanied youth's dispute uh, information uh, filed at level, you know, the level one appeal with the liaison, the decision that you rendered, and any additional information from the parent, unaccompanied youth, or homeless liaison. So our process requires the district have a conference with the parent um, or the unaccompanied youth within five business days. Now, pre-COVID, these were usually uh, in person, uh, but uh, as I've been hearing lately, um, these things have been accomplished through technology, at the very least a phone call um, where you can, where you can uh, have a conversation or this, the superintendent can have a conversation with either the parent, the legal guardian, or the unaccompanied youth. Uh, the written decision, again, it's got to be in writing, of the superintendent is to be provided within five business days. Um, and again, the district must verify that the family actually actually receives a copy of the decision. The, the timelines don't go unless you, unless you actually know that it's in their hands. Um, the parent or youth uh, has 10 business days to initiate a level three appeal to OSPI. This is the first point where uh, it will really be out of the hands of the school district. It will come up to the OSPI level. And the district has five business days to send all the required documentation of level one, the level one and the level two appeals to, uh, to OSBI. When it comes to us, um, just to give you, if you're interested in how the sausage is made, um, we have a committee that meets and we review all the paperwork, everything is read. Uh, and the members of that committee, they, they, they change depending upon the needs of the students. So for an example, if the, if the student has an IEP, then we would probably have a SPED expert on the committee. We issue our decision within 15 business days. Um, our decision is final, and that's uh, really an important reason why you should try to resolve it with the family. Uh, it takes it completely out of the family and the, um, and the liaison and the superintendent's uh, uh, decision making uh, if it comes up to OSPI. And again, the presumption is that the student's best interests are to remain at the school of origin. So if it is an enrollment dispute, it is a very heavy burden for districts to meet. Now, the final word on appeals is sometimes there are two or more districts that are involved and the liaisons have different opinions. In those cases, the student uh, shall be immediately enrolled uh, in the school where the enrollment is sought, just like always. Uh, and then either liaison can forward the request for a dispute resolution to OSPI. And then we will have 10 days to decide, you know, is one liaison right, is the other, or is it somewhere in the middle? Now, from all of this, I all of this information again is on those documents that I put in the chat, but the two main takeaways um, from, uh, from this is that the student is always going to stay enrolled in the school they are seeking enrollment during the appeals process. And if you add up all the days, it's about 70 business days. So you're really talking about like a semester of time that they're going to stay enrolled. But we really place a heavy emphasis on stability during this process. So that's, that's why that has to stay that way. 
And then the second takeaway would be that all of your decision must be in, the, in writing to the parent, legal guardian, or you. So make sure that uh, make sure they get a copy of anything that you're putting out. All right. Back to right. Sharon. Uh, thank you so much, Keith. Um, again, just invaluable information. We realize that this is a lot of information for everyone. Uh, for some of you, it's review, and for some of you, it may be new information. So just as a reminder, um, all everyone that you've heard uh, speak this morning, all of our panelists will be available for an open Q&A session after lunch today. Um, and also you will have access to this slide deck, which contains uh, some, li some links at the end of the deck, in addition to access to the recorded version of this training um, following the December training. Um, so just know that if you're not containing all the information right now, it's okay. Uh, we know it's a lot of information and you'll have access to it again. So with that, we have reached the time when you get to break out into uh, your individual breakout rooms, which we have assigned you to. Um, and here's what will happen. You will get sent to your breakout room. You will have about 15 minutes to just talk. And really, this is not a uh, time when we are going to give you an assignment, a specific prompt. You won't have to come back and share out or take notes or anything. This time is for you to our community. And so this is the time for community building for you to share with one another. Um, some of us will pop in and out of your rooms just to make sure that everything is going smoothly. And also, if at any reason, at any time, um, if you're in a room and you feel like maybe you want to pop out and pop into a different room for whatever reason, uh, because we have not organized the chat rooms into specific categories, this gives you an opportunity to ask each other questions from each other's perspective in your various roles and districts throughout the state. So. Um, and having said that, if you want to pop back out of the room, you can leave the room. You'll enter back into this main room where Aubrey and I will stay, um, and we can certainly send you into another room. So you'll have about 15 minutes for just open sharing and chatting. After that, uh, I'll post an announcement within your breakout rooms that it is lunchtime. So we'll move directly from the breakout se session into lunch. We have half an hour uh, for lunch. Um, so until 1.15, and that opportunity is also there for you to have a networking, working lunch with each other. You can uh, stay in the breakout room, have your lunch, take care of yourself, or walk away and go take care of yourself aside from or outside of this training, but we are going to uh, leave the breakout rooms open for you to interact with each other. We encourage you to consider through your conversations with each other some of your questions that you may have for a presenters because when we come back from lunch, we'll have a short um, message from Elmo. And then our morning panelists will all be available for you to uh, offer questions uh, and we'll have uh, some Q&A time. So with that, Tony, if you have additional uh, directions for us uh, from a technical perspective that we can consider before um, Oh, and also, yes, by the way, um, we will be taking attendance again for those of you who uh, left earlier, but were here this morning and you're returning uh, and you have ret and you returned after the previous break. So with that, Tony, um, do you have any additional instructions or guidance for us before we go into our breakout rooms? Uh, I think you got it pretty well covered. Uh, the one thing I will say, um, if you jump into a breakout room and then find at that point you have an issue with your audio or microphone working, go ahead and pop back into the main room and then we'll attempt to take care of that or, or help you out. That's all I have to add. Perfect. All right. So hopefully everybody understands we'll be in breakout rooms for about uh, – um, closer to 10 minutes now. However, uh, you'll be able to stay in your breakout rooms through our working lunch, which will end at 1.15. We will have our lunch uh, slide uh, in the main room. So if you need a reminder about what time lunch in there it is, and it will stay that way until we begin 
uh, the afternoon session. So enjoy your breakout time and your connection time with one another. And we'll see you soon. Aubrey? Hey, Sharon. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing good. There's a few people that I think came a little bit later, so I'm assigning them to rooms. Okay, and then when you get a moment, if you wouldn't mind just the music back on and we'll just leave it on until um, after lunch, unless it gets, unless we need to communicate and it's getting in the way, but Otherwise, yeah, we can just, and I'll hang out. I'm going to take a quick bio break and come right back and I'll just be here in case anybody needs anything. Okay, perfect. Okay. It's not in reactions. And anyone who has insight into that in how to access the raising your hand option. And here's why, because uh, if you raise your hand and we see your hand raised, uh, that would indicate to us that you have a question that you would like to ask via your microphone. So I would call on you and Aubrey will unmute your mic. So um, I can see when um, hands are raised, I believe, but I cannot offer guidance on how to do that. So if any of my colleagues um, have that information and can put it in the chat box, that would be wonderful. Um, in the meantime, I think what we'll do is just defer to the chat box for now. Um, and this is the time when you are free to answer questions uh, or ask questions or offer comments via chat. Sharon, this is Aubrey. Thank you. Hi, Aubrey. Hi. Um, I know Sheila had her hand raised first. Can I uh, go ahead and ask her to unmute? Yes, please. And I actually am not seeing where hands are raised. So if you are able um, to see that, Guys. that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So you're just asking how to unmute or how to raise your hand? Yes, I just wanted to share with the other participants how to use the raise your hand feature so that we can unmute your mic and you can ask our morning panelists your questions. Okay, so all you have to do is go down to participants. Pardon? On to participants. So if and you then, go to participants. And then down at the bottom, you can raise your hand. And at this point, I'm going to lower my hand because I raised my hand to show you. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Sharon, um, Sarah Miller is raising her hand. Okay, so uh, if we can please unmute Sarah's microphone. And Sarah, please feel free to ask your question. Maybe um, helpful to identify which uh, presenter or um, which category, uh, what, your what your question is pertaining to. So the, yeah. Okay, my question is for uh, Melinda. In your presentation about uh, local liaison duties, you mentioned a new resource by NCHE, and I did not write it down fast enough, but I was hoping you could reshare what that resource is again. 
Uh, do you remember which one it was? Because I believe I mentioned more than one from NCHE and I don't have there the was, slides in front of me. Yeah, there was two on the slide. It was like local liaison. Oh, yeah. I've, I've lost you, Sarah, but um, I will put those in the chat. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question and thank you, Melinda. And then Aubrey, feel free if you see other raised hands because I cannot see hands that are raised. In there, the meantime, yeah. There are no hands raised at the moment. Okay. So if you have questions, please put them into the chat box. I'm gonna scroll up um, to see if there are questions or comments from this morning um, that you may have entered. Okay, it looks like Mark Castle raised his Okay. Thank you. So uh, I also put this question in the chat earlier and I put it again, is OSPI working with other state agencies to help us help students. For example, it's really hard to get a student uh, state issued ID from department's licensing. Uh, I, you know, if I wanted to get an unaccompanied youth, their social security number, uh, that's, they have to be 18 to be able to do that. And if they don't have an active family member helping us, it's um, really creating some roadblocks. So uh, that's my question around, is the, has the state looked at, um, have it agencies talk to each other so we can get some more help once they leave our building or for other challenges that these students face. Thank you for the question, Mark. I can, I can answer part of it. So uh, this past legislative session, um, the 2020 session, there's a bill that passed substitute house bill 2607. And one of the requirements is for OSPI to consult with the department of licensing specifically to remove barriers um, to getting identity cards, state issued ID cards for unaccompanied youth and creating a process for district liaisons or really any district staff to be able to support students directly um, in that application and to be able to essentially affirm, yes, the student is who they say they are, even if they don't have all the documents um, that they would expect for their normal their normal process. So we've gone through consultation this summer. We are waiting eagerly for the Department of Licensing to um, issue that final process. And when they do, we will host a webinar to explain uh, exactly that. Um, on that note, for students who are, uh, for unaccompanied youth who are employed, there's also a way for them to get access to driver's licenses um, if they're under 18 and they don't have a parent or guardian willing to sign. Um, their employer can actually sign for them um, to be able to get that license. Um, and we can, I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Um, and again, you'll be hearing more about that state ID card process once we have confirmed uh, the final process with licensing. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Matt. It looks like we do have another participant with a raised hand. And I also saw a question in the chat box um, from um, our participant from South Whidbey who was asking about um, the term legal guardian and wondering if a temporary guardian is enough in terms of um, definition. And I don't know, this is Mary, I don't know, can you say more about, about your question? Feel free to either raise your hand so we can unmute your mic or offer more in the chat box. Um, yeah, I was just when, when it came up about unaccompanied youth and guardian, it just said guardian. And so I really wanted to clarify that it was a legal guardian and not just a temporary guardian or a relative that was taking care of a student or youth. I can, uh, I can weigh in, although Melinda would be perfectly capable of doing it as well. But no, the, um, <clears throat> the requirements and, and when it talks about guardian, the McKinney-Bento Act is talking about a legal guardian. So it's talking about where there is a court order of guardianship. 
So if it's not that, if they're just with their with a family, then they are very likely an unaccompanied um, homeless youth, um, and they'd have, they'd be coded as doubled up um, in in the system. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. Sure. No problem. Thank you for the question, and thank you, Keith. And then Aubrey, it looks like we do have a couple of raised hands in the. Yes, uh, Jamie Morrow from Tacoma, Tacoma Public Schools. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. We can, yes. I wanted to add to Mark's question. I know he was asking specifically about IDs, but we are having issues, well, one that we're working on right now um, for birth certificates from other states. When it's an unaccompanied youth, they're under 18 and they, are requ they require, I know that we've been able to order them from Pierce County without much of an issue, but out of state seems to be an issue. Is there anything that OSPI can provide or any, any hints or assistance um, in getting birth certificates for unaccompanied youth out of state? That's a great question. I am gonna defer to one of my colleagues for um, thoughts and feedback. Melinda, do you have any thoughts about, about that question? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I, I thought it was the same question that had already been previously answered, but. Uh... It was, sure. Um, it was, I know Mark was asking about state IDs like Washington or um, identification cards. My question is in reference to uh, birth certificates from out of state. We haven't had an issue with getting them from Pierce County um, within Washington, but if it's an out-of-state unaccompanied uh, birth certificate for an unaccompanied youth under age 18, we seem to be having some challenges. They want it to be a parent or a legal guardian that's requesting it, and for an unaccompanied youth, that's not an option. So I didn't know if there was any tips or guidance that you guys had on that. Right. Um, that's not an uncommon barrier, unfortunately, because there are certain parameters around requesting birth certificates. Um, you know, for unaccompanied students. What I have done in the past to help districts out is to work with the other state coordinators that I know if it's from a state, you know, one of our neighboring states or pretty much anywhere. And I can work with those uh, state coordinators in other states to get a little bit of information about access to birth certificates. Um, we're working on one right now with Idaho, for example. Um, other than connecting you with the the other state coordinators so they can help to clarify what their particular state rules are around access to birth certificates. I don't have a great answer, but I'm happy to troubleshoot one-on-one -on -one with uh, liaisons to help work our way through the process. Okay, great. So am I, is it okay just to email you directly? Yeah, that would be fine. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. You bet. We do what we can, um, but like I say, it's uh, it can be hard, especially for unaccompanied kids. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thank you both. And I believe there's another raised hand. Yes, Jody Burwell from Vashon Island School District. Hi, thank you. I, my question is um, some guidance on transportation. Um, we have very limited bus service on our island, but we do offer some ORCA cards to our McKinney Vento students. And um, when our school is remote learning, I'm just curious if there's any problem using Title I funds to, to fund those cards when they're, um, you know, they're not going to sports, they're not going to school activities, but they may be going to some counseling services. Um, how, how closely do I need to track that? Um, I think a bus pass is more of a mental health piece on our island. Um, and I'm just kind of curious if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, Penelope might have additional thoughts on the Title I piece as far as how it needs to be tracked, but I can tell you that Title I set aside money as well as regular Title I money can be used to support homeless students by providing for the excess costs of transportation to and from school of origin. Now that we are in a virtual environment, school of origin, you know, might look a little bit different because you're 
the students are accessing online instead of in person. Uh, however, I think uh, in many cases, Title I can help assist with getting kids to certain services, depending on whether or not it's educationally related and if it's a referral from the school, for example, for mental health uh, screenings or things like that. And I don't know if Penelope's back on, but she may have additional thoughts about the tracking piece. Thank you, Melinda. So what we usually recommend, and this is because when we do monitoring, we do look at uh, the set aside and see how you're spending it and how much is left from year to year. Uh, so what we want you to do is make sure that you do have a code or a, a way of tracking your expenditures. So anything that you spend that goes directly to homeless uh, services or you know, that directly is an expenditure for the, uh, for the homeless uh, set aside. You do track that at the local level, either with a code or with subcoding, whatever is required or necessary from your district. But we do uh, review it uh, when, whenever we do uh, monitoring for either the federal programs or the state programs. We do uh, specifically for Title One. I can tell you that we do look at that um, when you do uh, get a monitor um, assignment or when, whenever we go back to monitoring, basically. So just make sure to track it at the local level with your whatever um, subcode or code that you have at the district level. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Penelope. And then Amy in the chat box asked if anyone has links to pictures, infographics, public use for pamphlets, websites, and publications. She says she uses Schoolhouse Connection and Schoolhouse Washington. Let's see if I can get the rest of this message. Uh, sometimes for PowerPoints and would love to have a toolkit with free use uh, of resources and, and, and infographics for school districts if those are available. And um, Melinda did put a link in the chat box. Um, and it is based on uh, information that was created on contract with NCHE. But I don't know that that has infographics in it, however. That's information regarding the selection of the school district liaison. Oh, I see. Okay, I apologize. I didn't open the link and made that assumption. So my mistake. Um, I. OSPI does not have specific um, infographics right now to share. Um, I'm happy to track some things down. I would guess Schoolhouse Connection would probably be our best, our best bet or the National Center for Homeless Education. Building Changes has done some terrific infographics in the past when they've helped us with training and they may also be a good resource, um, but I know you've already checked with a couple of those resources. But we may be able to track down more if you want to email uh, separately. I can see what I can do. Thank you so much, Melinda. And then I will go to you, Aubrey. There's a couple other questions in the chat box that I can ask. And before I do that, I'll check to see if there are any raised hands. We're good, no raised hands. Okay. So uh, Mira Lee um, asked the question, um, so students or children being dropped off with other adult caretakers is a big issue trying to get kids registered. It was difficult, it, it was just discussed by DCYF in a King County webinar last night. There are different types of emergency guardianship classifications. It would be so good to get more training on this and to know how to provide help and support for these caregivers. So it sounds like uh, unaccompanied youth who are now in the care of, uh, of caretakers, but not necessarily, um, they're not foster parents, they're not officially guardians. Is that the scenario, Marilee? And feel free to either um, raise your hand so we can unmute your microphone or um, add more clarification in the chat box, if you wouldn't mind. If you're still on the call. Okay, and if any of my colleagues have uh, any thoughts about that question, Keith, maybe. Um, 
I don't have any thoughts about the DCYF. Um, it sounds like more of a suggestion. I would note that uh, under Washington state law, an unaccompanied youth can enroll themselves. So you don't need a, a guardian, a legal guardian or, or a parent to enroll the student. And that, that would be true for the McKinney-Vento Act as well, but it is a Washington specific law that they, they can enroll themselves. Okay, and thank you. Let's see, I'm scrolling through the chat box to see if there are additional questions. Please don't hold back or hesitate and even comments are welcomed. Uh, if there's information that you would like us to know um, that would be helpful in terms of how we can support you in the work that you do, that is also welcomed in the chat box, uh, specifically uh, related to the information that you heard this morning and the comments that you've already made um, are perfect. So um, let's see, someone um, made a comment that they were confused about absences and no truancy petition being filed. Um, let's see, says this is Anna and who is the counselor? Let's see, sorry. I am wanting to scroll to that message and I keep overshooting it in the chat box. So Anna, if you are on the call. Karen, this is, yeah, and, and Chrissy did respond in the chat box. Wonderful. Well, I'm, and I'm thinking for the sake of um, others who may not have read her response, um, Chrissy, if, you re if you're on the call still and recall that question, could you elaborate, please? I think uh, Anna's question was about um, just needing more clarity, given that this is such a new announcement that the policy, that the emergency rule was filed yesterday and was effective yesterday. So I think she just had some general questions and I clarified that, um, that for remote learning absences, um, those absences should not be treated as unexcused and therefore not accrue for um, the filing of a truancy petition. This would be retroactive back to October 5th. So districts might have already filed petitions um, and those, those would need to be um, dismissed if they've been filed since October 5th. Um, so there's going to be a lot more detail coming out in the bulletin um, and we'll continue to message thoroughly to multiple um, roles. Uh, so superintendents will get it in the next couple of days. Um, your district truancy liaison has a preliminary message. Um, so uh, without taking up too much time, much more time about those details, um, I just wanna add one more thing that it's um, this new category of non-truancy remote learning absence applies to remote learning absences only, not in person. And then I, I, I put some more in the chat. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Then I did want to also note that uh, Dr. Matt Smith did put a, uh, a PDF of an affidavit that employers can sign in lieu of a parent or guardian to obtain a driver's license for unaccompanied youth. And I know somebody had asked that question earlier. Um, so it is in the chat box. Let's see, posted it at 126, just for your reference so you can find it. So we still do have almost 10 minutes. Um, if anyone has additional thoughts or questions to offer or share, and if not, I would welcome any of our participants who want to add additional comments um, regarding um, the information that you all shared this morning, knowing that everybody was trying to be mindful of time and making sure that everybody had an opportunity to share their um, information. Um, but given that, if anybody wants to add additional thoughts or comments that, uh, or elaborate on them, if you felt that you needed to abbreviate them earlier, this would also be a good time to do that. It looks like uh -huh. Penny has her hand raised as well. So um, we can do both. Penny, would you like to, uh, Aubrey, if you would unmute Penny's Hi. microphone. And then Keith, please, um, when Penny is finished. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I put a question in the chat box that might have been buried, but I was wondering if someone could speak more about the rules on accessing funding for transportation for preschool students. 
So I know our school district has a variety of preschool options. And I'm just wondering how you tell when you can use transportation fund or money to spend on transportation and when you can't, if that makes sense. So are you speaking specifically to preschool students or yes. any students? specifically to preschool? Um, because the preschool provisions are pretty much the same as they would be for K through 12 now that preschoolers have the right to attend school of origin. So you'd look to your transportation dollars first. Excess costs like preschool costs can come from McKinney Vento grant funding. Um, if your district happened to have a grant or okay. other school district uh, funds, but it would be the same transportation dollars that would that would be used to, to cover transportation for your K through 12 kids. For the okay, most part. so it, it doesn't matter what type of programming it is, whether it's Head Start versus your own community based preschool. It, it needs to be a, a McKinney Vento preschool for purposes of transportation. Um, so how do you tell if it's covered by McKinney Vento, you yeah. need to look and see if it is operated by your local school district. So okay. if it's staffed by your local school district, if it is uh, House. paid for by your local school district, you know, there's a kind of a, a group of questions you can ask yourself that are found in the FAQ, the McKinney Vento FAQ, about okay. determining if you have, uh, if your preschool really qualifies as a McKinney Vento uh, eligible preschool program. Um, even if it's uh, off site, sometimes they might be operated by the school district, but okay. you'll, you're, <clears throat> excuse me, you probably need to ask some questions about how it's operated and funded. Uh, sometimes you have preschools where there will be a, a community organization that will rent space in a school district facility, but it's not paid for by the district or staffed by the district, but, and those would not be considered uh, McKinney Vento. Okay. Uh, preschools for purposes of, of school of origin rights and transportation. So there's a few details that you probably would want to look at as far as determining that this, the preschool really is a public preschool. Uh, and then once you've determined that it is and it's operated by the school district, then, then all of the provisions of McKinney Vento kick in. If Thank you need the link to the uh, document about preschool, I will try to put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. That'd be great. You bet. Thank you so much for your question and thank you, Melinda. And just as a note to everyone, um, there are some um, resource links in the chat, uh, some that are responses to some of the questions you had earlier and some are in addition to those. Uh, Dr. Matt Smith did put a link to the 2020 state legislation uh, creating a streamlined process for access to ID cards for uh, in regards to the question that was asked earlier. So please be sure to peruse the chat box and access those linked resources. And Keith, um, did you have additional uh, thoughts and comments that you wanted to add as well? I just saw uh, Claudia had um, uh, a common uh, unaccompanied youth question in the chat. This uh, was our legal obligation to speak to parents if a student is attempting to enroll without them. Um, and I get that question a lot. And um, you don't have an obligation to necessarily speak to a parent. Now, what you do have to do is comply with FERPA. And what FERPA says is that parents uh, have a right uh, to review educational records, K through 12 educational records. So if a parent comes, you've got an unaccompanied youth, they're enrolled, um, and the parent wants to come and look at their report card or look at their record or look at some other record. Uh, if it's K through 12, then yes, uh, the parent can get a copy of it. Um, if they're doing something like running start where they have some college records in there, those are not included. This is just the specifics of the of the FERPA Act. Um, and then the McKinney Vento Act specifically says that uh, the latest version of it specifically says that unaccompanied youth are in the driver's seat when they're choosing um, like school of origin or neighborhood school like they're the ones that the when enrolling they're the ones that um, that the district has to listen to. So if the parent has a different opinion about what would be in the best interest of, uh, you know, in terms of enrollment, it is the unaccompanied youth that makes that decision. Thank you. And thank you for your question. Thank you, Keith. 
Um, we have time for maybe one more question before we transition into the next segment. Uh, Sharon, I see there's a question that was posted in the chat at 135 from Lisa Sim Rodriguez in North Beach. Um, and it says, are there good avenues for conversation with our tribal friends regarding members who are experiencing homelessness? And I wonder if John Claymore is able to address that one. Looks like he's That's still on. Question. John, are you still with us and able to address that question? Yes, Sharon and, and Matt, and thank you. And, and um, Lisa um, from North Beach out there in Pacific Beach. Um, this is one of my first jobs actually was out in Tohola, Washington on a Quinault Indian reservation as a teacher. But uh, my suggestion there would be to reach out, reach out to those tribes and so forth and take a look at what those support sy um, systems look look like um, within the, the tribes um, identified. I'm pretty sure you're probably talking about um, um, Quinault students and so forth, but there's some definitely some avenues there within the tribes and within the, our organization as well. So hopefully that, uh, I know that's not the best answer, but uh, that's the best I can give at this time. Thank you so much. And thank you all for your questions. Um, we will uh, review the chat box after this training and um, our uh, our vision is to put together a Q&A or an FAQ rather that we can include when we send you all access to uh, the resources contained in this, uh, in this training event today. So, um, so thank you again for participating in our Q&A and thank you presenters, everyone who uh, was available to answer questions. Thank you so much. So now we're going to take a brief pause. We're going to hear a short message from Elmo, and then we will move into our afternoon panel presentations. Oh, <laughs> Elmo's so happy to see you. Okay, Elmo and Elmo's friends on Sesame Street are thinking about everybody out there who's having a hard time. Yeah, you know, Elmo heard that sometimes families don't have a place to live and they don't feel safe. Boy, that makes Elmo feel sad. But Elmo's daddy told Elmo that when kids don't have a home, schools can be a good and safe place for them just like a home. Boy, Elmo loves school because it helps kids and monsters grow healthy and smart. <laughs> yeah. Elmo's daddy also told Elmo that there are grown-ups who can help make sure all kids get to go to school every day. Oh, and their parents can ask those grown-ups for help. Elmo's sending everybody hugs because Elmo knows that hugs help. Oh, and kisses too. Mwah, mwah. Elmo loves you. Bye-bye. And thank you, Elmo, for that timely message. And, you know, just a reminder, you are that community that the uh, students and families are reaching out to. And we just thank you for being uh, that, that friendly face on the other end of that uh, difficult phone call or uh, reach out as they contact you um, to ask for support. Or as you identify uh, needs, um, when sometimes it's hard, it's hard for people to ask themselves. So with that, we are gonna move on to our panel presentations and resources. You see the list here. Uh, so please uh, be prepared as you hear the information that's gonna be shared with you. Similar to this morning, we will have a question and answer session following these presentations. And we're very excited and delighted um, that each of these presenters are joining us today. And so we are gonna start with our own Peggy Carlson um, and she will be talking about the foster care program. Peggy. Hi everybody. I'm getting that dreaded message that says my internet is unstable. So I'm gonna turn my camera off. I'm sorry, <laughs> um, but I don't, I want you to be able to hear me at the very least. Um, I'm also going to stick in the chat box some links that, that I'll refer to when I'm doing my presentation. Sometimes it's helpful to have those links as we go, um, but I'm not good at, at doing both posting links and speaking. So there are some links and 
Again, I'm Peggy Carlson. I am the OSPI Foster Care Program Supervisor, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about how this is really high level stuff, but we're going to look at the um, similarities between foster care and McKinney Vento. Um, as you can see, there are definitely more students experiencing homelessness uh, in this country and in our state. And I think we all expect those numbers to go up as, um, as an effect of COVID with people losing their jobs. Um, and I know it's really hard to identify these kids when we're in a remote learning situation, but primarily you would just wanna know there are about 7,000 students in foster care. And while the numbers are different for each population, the needs and the services are very similar. Um, next slide, Aubrey. Great, thank you. I, I don't know if it's delayed on my end, but I'm, I apologize if I'm going out on you. <laughs> so um, as you all know, federal law requires schools to support both students who are experiencing homelessness and students in foster care. Prior to ESSA, uh, some students in foster care were considered McKinney-Vento eligible. Uh, they talked about students awaiting foster care, but when they wrote ESSA, they removed that category from McKinney-Vento and instead created new provisions specifically for students in foster care. You'll still hear people say, oh, they're in foster care, so they qualify for McKinney-Vento, but that's really not accurate. Students in foster care have their own provisions. They're separate from McKinney-Vento, um, but they're very similar. Uh, just like McKinney-Vento requires districts to designate a homeless liaison, ESSA requires every district, district to designate a foster care liaison. Both groups of students are entitled to school of origin rights. For foster care, school of origin is the default setting. So students in foster care must remain in their school of origin unless there's a best interest determination that finds it more appropriate for the student to enroll in the neighborhood school. And I posted a link about best interest determinations. The other similarity is uh, immediate enrollment. Both groups are entitled to immediate enrollment. That means the child should be enrolled in and attending a new school as soon as possible. And enrollment must not be denied or delayed because they don't have the documents needed. Uh, the two issues that come up the most frequently for kids in foster care are IEPs and immunizations. And often we'll hear districts say, we can't enroll them until we update their IEP, or we can't enroll this student because they don't have proof of immunizations. This is not in line with the federal law. The law requires students in foster care to be enrolled immediately, even if they don't have proof of immunizations, and even if their IEP is outdated. Okay, next slide. So eligibility, uh, the federal law defines foster care as placement away from the parent or guardian while child welfare has placement and care authority. So this could be a foster home, a relative placement, a group home, a pre-adoptive home, as long as the department, Department of Children, Youth and Families has authority over the case. Uh, this also includes students in tribal foster care when the tribe's child welfare has placement and care authority, and it includes students in federal foster care. Uh, those, those students are considered unaccompanied refugee minors. Uh, there are only a handful of those across the state, but, but these provisions do apply to them. The big question that comes, off, that comes up is related to students in a trial return home. And while kids who, who are on a trial return home don't technically meet the federal definition of foster care, there are some state statutes that apply to these students. And I posted that foster care eligibility flowchart that talks a little bit more about state laws. Okay, next slide. So 
So how do we identify students in foster care? There are three general ways that, that students identify these kids. The CEDARS foster care report is, and I put the, the instructions for running that in the chat box. Um, this is a result of a data sharing agreement between DCYF and OSPI. So every night DCYF sends OSPI the names of school aged children in foster care. OSPI matches those names with the correct students. And then we send education information back to DCYF and they use that to populate their fam link, which is their student information system. And then OSPI also sends those names out to districts through CEDARS. And the foster care liaison in each district is able to run a report that will show them which students are in DCYF foster care. Uh, just a reminder that that CEDARS report will only identify DCYF children in foster care. It doesn't include um, students who may be under tribal child welfare jurisdiction or students in federal foster care. The other two ways that schools learn about foster care status are from the school notification form and the caregiver authorization form. Uh, these forms, the school notification form is supposed to be provided to districts anytime a student comes into foster care or anytime they change foster care placements. Um, we're, we see high utilization of this form in some parts of the state, in other parts of the state we don't. Uh, we're working with DCYF and, and doing meetings with caseworkers and, and supervisors so that they know to provide that form. Okay, next slide. So this question comes up uh, a lot. And can a student qualify for both McKinney-Vento and foster care? And the answer is yes. This can happen when a student is first identified as experiencing homelessness. And then uh, later that school year, the student goes into foster care. It also happens when kids run away from homes, uh, they would then qualify for McKinney-Vento too. And sometimes we see trial return home situation where the department actually places students back with their parents. And then the student, if the housing situation qualifies for McKinney-Vento, then they would qualify uh, for both programs. We recommend that students who do qualify for both programs be served under McKinney-Vento. Um, a student in foster care may go back home and the case may be closed, but if they qualify for McKinney-Vento, McKinney they'll be eligible the entire school year. Okay, next slide. So transportation um, is required in the federal law for both students in foster care and students experiencing homelessness. Uh, the, the big difference is for students in foster care, districts are required to collaborate with the department on foster care, on transportation. Uh, with McKinney-Vento, districts are required to collaborate with each other. Um, if a student's in foster care, the district of origin is the district responsible for collaborating with DCYF on transportation. Now, there may be um, a lot of districts kind of have these agreements where they do collaborate on transportation, and that's totally fine. You can do that, but um, ultimately the responsibility lies with the district of origin and, and with child welfare. Next slide. So I think this is an important slide because when we talk about uh, racism and when we talk about students in foster care being pushed out of schools, um, this really puts that puts this in, in a picture that we can all understand. So those um, darker brownish bars, those are students in foster care. And then the light blue are students who are not in foster care. And then that darker teal are students experiencing homelessness. So these are the discipline rates. Um, these are kids who've been excluded or suspended from school. And, 
and if you just look at the um, the let's look at the black African American students, you can see that. 19.4% of students who are Black and in foster care, 19.4% are being pushed out of schools. And if you compare that to all students who are not in foster care, it's 4%. So I, I just wanted this slide in here because I think every district needs to really be examining their data to see what, what is happening with these kids. Um, I think it's also uh, an important issue to talk about social emotional learning, trauma-informed care, because I think a lot of the reasons kids in foster care are being pushed out um, is due to trauma. They have behaviors that are challenging. And often what happens is they, they end up being pushed out of school um, because the, the school staff aren't really sure how to deal with that, with those behaviors and that trauma. So um, it's a, just another reason why trauma-informed care and, um, and social emotional learning is so important for, for all districts and especially for our students in foster care. Next slide. Uh, oh, I have these two. I will put them in the chat box. Um, these are links. Let's see. See if I can get it in here. Um, these are the lots of different resources uh, that we have. And there we go. We'll put them in there. <laughs> uh, so the OSPI foster care education page, um, you can go on there and that has any kind of information you would ever need. Um, please use that as a resource. On that page, you'll also find the foster care FAQs, which seem to be really helpful to a, a lot of liaisons. And then there's a document that is a, an information document for new foster care liaisons. And that really, if you are also a foster care liaison, I highly recommend you print out that document or save it on your computer. It, it really goes through what all of the roles and responsibilities are for foster care liaisons. And then there's also a link in the chat box to our liaison forums. We have monthly forums for both homeless liaisons and foster care liaisons. We try to pick topics that are of interest to both populations uh, on the second Thursday of the month. So we have one coming up this week about um, some native student. Uh, in sign up for those. You don't have to be a liaison. Uh, we want everyone. And my email is on there as well. So if you have questions, I know this was quick and high level, but if you even if you want to schedule a phone call, you, you send me an email. We can schedule phone time and we can talk through any of the issues that you may be having or questions that you have. So thank you so much. It's, it's exciting to see all the all the people on here and I'm um, and thank you Sharon for giving me time. Thank you so much Peggy for joining us and also um, definitely highlighting the work that we collectively have cut out for us in serving um, what is clearly a set of our most vulnerable um, population within our student community. And so uh, thank you also for the resources Peggy and just for um, your tireless work with um, offering and providing uh, this information. So thank you so much. So next, uh, we will be joined by Mike Donlin as part of our OSPI team and our uh, student safety program. Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. This is a beautiful day. It's going along really nicely. And I thank you for allowing me to join you today. Um, we put the slide that we were talking about school safety and the next slide, please. There we go. Usually when I have a conversation like this, I start off by asking people, what does school safety mean to you? And depending on the, the audience that's in the, in the room with me, I get a whole bunch of different kinds of answers. And usually, whatever anybody says, my response is, yep, that's part of it. Yep, that's part of it. Yep, that's part of it too. So we're gonna take a little bit of time this afternoon and go through some, again, really high level 
topics, issues, things that are happening right now statewide in terms of school safety. And the first thing, the slide you see right here is the RCW, which requires schools and school districts to have a comprehensive school safety or comprehensive district safety plan. Sometimes these are called EOP, Emergency Operations Plan. The interesting thing is that this legislation has been around for, this is 15, 20 years. It changes a little bit from session to session and so forth, but bottom line, one of the most important things that's indicated in the legislation, if you go down to that RCW and go back to way down to the bottom, it recognizes, the legislature recognizes that comprehensive school safety plans are of paramount importance. That's critical, of paramount importance to ensure that our schools provide the safest possible learning environment. And then it goes, it talks about for staff, for students, for families, for partners in the age in the in the educational process and so forth. So it's really important. It's mandated by law, and schools or districts are required to have comprehensive safety plans. The question then says, so what? What does this mean to me? Well, the last part of this slide here says these comprehensive safety plans address prevention, mitigation, protection, response, and recovery for all threats and hazards. I'm thinking of the populations that we're talking about today, the homeless populations, McKinney populations, those very at-risk populations for one reason or another. And think about those things within a school, within a school context that might be addressed in safety plans that specifically relate to their particular needs. Now again, what, one more thing here, when it talks about all threats and hazards, as we work, as we're working with districts and schools, we, we clump those up into four main categories just to give people a sense of what it is that might be included, should be included, could be included in their particular district or school plan. And those four main categories of threats and hazards are natural threats and hazards like, oh, here we are, we're living here on the uh, Cascade subduction zone, like earthquakes or wildfires or winter storms, any kind of natural hazard that might impact the school or the life of a young person coming to school. Next, biological hazards. We're living in a pandemic right now. Here's a question. Has the COVID experience that we're all going through right now in any way impacted the students that we're working with? I think the answer is yes. So that's one more thing that these plans should address. How do we deal with that? Natural, biological, technological threats and hazards, hazmat, power outages, train wrecks, all those kinds of things that might impact the school and the safety of the young people in the school. And finally, the one that is probably the most, most often comes to mind, human caused or adversarial threats and hazards like bullying like harassment, like harassment, intimidation, and bullying, like trafficking, whether it's labor trafficking or sex trafficking. So plans for the safety of all the staff, students, anybody coming into the school, the plans are for all students. And the needs of all students and particular subsets of students need to be addressed within those plans. So if go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, now, I mentioned that the requirement for the safety plan, eh, it, it, it's always there. It's built into legislation. It's been around for a long time. It slightly changes maybe each session, a little bit here and there. We'll hit some of those changes as we move forward. But right now, within the larger context of school safety, these are some of the hot topics that we're working with. Uh, 2019, uh, House Bill 1216 established regional school safety centers, not just at OSPI, but regional school safety centers at each of the nine ESDs to help ensure that there's localized support for schools in developing their plans and in providing and addressing those safety issues. So as we're moving forward, those re re regional school safety centers uh, the coordination among them and the coordination among them with OSPI is growing all the time. And there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of, a lot of play so that we get the concepts we need, the supports we need, the trainings we need, those things that we need across the state 
more regionalized for all the schools and districts. A big topic in school safety right now is behavioral mental health and suicide prevention. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that because the next session that you have in December, Ann Gray, one of our colleagues, is going to be talking about this in much more detail. But there's this growing recognition that this is a very serious, very serious issue. And in conversations with legislators, that is quietly, but in conversations with legislators, the encouragement to, to fund this work, fund it adequately. I'll just say that, adequately fund the work. In concert with that, another of the major topics right now, and it goes back to the regional school safety centers and behavioral mental health and suicide is behavioral threat assessment. And 12, six, House Bill 1216 also required schools and districts to have a behavioral threat assessment program and behavioral threat assessment coordination in their districts. Now, behavioral threat assessment, threat assessment uh, within the state of Washington we're using the Salem-Kaiser model as our basis for behavioral threat assessment, for behavioral threat assessment program. When I'm talking to folks about school safety and threat assessment, the words threat assessment come up. That's often confusing for people because it sounds like it, they think of or different, different constituency groups use the term threat assessment to mean different things. What we're talking about is a program, a process, consistent formalized protocol whereby schools can address the threatening or potentially threatening behavior of students and also the circumstances around which that student which may have caused that student to behave that way or to make the threats or to behave in a threatening way. Thinking back to the students that we're talking about today, might there be something in the life of the, of the students who are who are experiencing homelessness or in foster care? which could be traumatic, which could impact the way they behave in school. And might it be a good idea to have some kind of a consistent protocol to say, let's see what's happening with Johnny. Let's try to figure out how we can best support him and make sure that he is not a threat to himself or others. One of the things that takes up a whole lot of my time is harassment, intimidation, and bullying, or our shorthand in Washington, HIV. HIV, harassment, intimidation, and bullying are closely related. They're spelled out, they're lumped together in the legislation, they're collapsed in the wording that we use, but they're really separate behaviors. And it's really important to distinguish among these behaviors and to recognize that although they are joined at the hip, kissing cousins, if you will, one may lead to the other, they are separate behaviors and have different kinds of consequences within the legislation that requires policy and procedure for HIV, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, there's a requirement that each school district have an HIV compliance officer. And that officer has to be known by everybody in the district, should be known by everybody in the district. And someone who we, we document and whose name we put forth on the, on the uh, school safety website. The reason for this is that's the point person. When complaints come in, if something happens, generally they happen at the classroom level, at the school level, and then it may rise up to the district level as well. And that point person who will oversee the investigations into the, into the allegations is, is identified as that HIV contact person. In the training for the HIV com compliance officers now, we're, we're also including the requirement that the, uh, for the coordination, the, well, the, the close working relationship with a new capacity within the district, the transgender or gender inclusive person, paralleling the HIV compliance officer, paralleling Title IX, maybe even the same person across districts. But the idea that there are separate functions, separate categories, potentially separate legal implications, and the folks in those capacities across districts need to know each other and how to work together. And when there's a handoff from one, back, one behavior, it turns out to be a different behavior. Who handles it and how is it handled across the district? One of the issues that comes up a lot with HIV, of course, is cyberbullying and digital safety. So we have a lot of, we do a lot of work with that and there's a lot of resources on our webpage around 
cyberbullying as a form of bullying or potentially harassment or potentially intimidation. So those things are all connected and overlapped. The last three are topics that are, are fairly new to the conversation. Not, I shouldn't say new to the conversation, but new to the legislation around the conversation for school safety. 1216, among other things, also established for the first time ever, a statewide school resource officer program. Now schools and districts are not required, not required to have an SRO. They're not required to have an SRO program, but if they do, then there are very specific details and very specific requirements for that program to be in place within a school district. And they involve training, they involve policy procedure, they involve MOU, they involve the, involve, the involvement of, of families, of, of community partners in the whole process. So that's something that's in the works. And um, actually, this is the first year that the requirements have rolled out. And given the, con the COVID nature of things, it's kind of like, a hmm, let's see how this plays out as we move forward. Um, in mentioning earlier on, in mentioning the different categories of threats and hazards, I mentioned the natural threats and hazards. And one of the changes that happened with 1216 this past a couple of years ago, 2019 into 20, changes in the requirements for school drills. Now, there's a drilling requirement that, that there's a drill requirement that calls for schools to have one drill a month, every month that students are in session. And there are very specific call outs, evacuation drills. Um, now, now, well, I'm just gonna jump into this really quickly. Now, of course, there's a requirement for an earthquake drop cover hold drill. And we do that fairly well across the state when we participate, all, hopefully all of us participate in the Great Shakeout in October. But along with earthquakes, tsunamis, and so those schools and those districts that are in map tsunami zones along the coast, they have to have a walking tsunami drill. And now something new this year, and I just this morning got word out to all the superintendents who are involved, there's also a requirement for a walking evacuation drill for Lahars. Some people have no idea what Lahar is, but those schools that are in Lahar zones, mainly on the sides of the volcanoes, need to prepare for that eventuality just in case. Finally, school mapping. Uh, this is one of those funky things that's been around for a long time, and some folks out there in schools and in districts know of it. Most everybody knows of it. It's been in existence and it's been required for use in schools for roughly ballpark 20 or 15 years. But funding has basically run out. The, the, the software itself behind the mapping system is old. It hasn't been updated. Uh, the use of the mapping system is really spotty across the state. And so chances are that system will be out of commission by the end of this, well, this current school year, by the end of next, next spring. Anyway, so those are some of the hot topics that we're working with. And my question is always just, just this alone, uh, starting right here at this point, what does this mean to you? What does this mean to the work you do? How does this impact your kids? And their families and their caregivers. What are some of those important things that you need to consider and things that you might want to jump in and say, let me be a part of this process for you. A couple of things I'm thinking about is when we're, <clears throat> excuse me, when doing drills, um, reunification. There's a requirement, you know, there should, we, we schools need to be doing planning for reunification in the event of, of, an, of an emergency. Do the folks in your school know how to contact the, the caregivers, the families of your students, of those students that we're talking about today in particular? How do you communicate with them? What kind of transportation is necessary in the event of an emergency for those young folks? So just, just tossing this off the top of my head as things to consider. And my last question to you would be then, 
within your schools, within your district, are you part of your district or your school safety team, safety planning team? And if not, I would really encourage you to become part of that through the district, through the superintendent, who was ever putting together that team in your school building, the schoolhouse itself, through the principal or who's ever putting together the team in the house and actively be part of the planning to make sure that your young folks are safe in the event that something happens in the school. So that will go to the next slide, which is the link to our school safety center. I'm sorry, I thought I had my contact information on there as well. And I looked, I just realized I didn't, didn't put it down there. So I'll drop that into the chat. But school safety covers a whole bunch of things. It's an ever-changing, very, very fluid kind of a topic. And a lot of things that we don't ordinarily think of right off the top of our heads definitely impact each and every one of our students in need. So with that, I will close and I'll drop my contact information into the chat box. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, um, Mike, for, for joining us and for offering up that information, school safety as we all know is just critical, particularly in these unprecedented times. Um, and again, as a reminder to everyone, um, after we have moved through our presenters, we will be taking a, another break at three o'clock and then coming back with, um, with a Q&A with these presenters that you're hearing um, this afternoon. So with that, we are gonna move on to our guests and uh, seemed partners that we really appreciate are joining us today from Building Changes, Maharet and Sammy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so excited to join you all. And we are troopers hanging in, hanging in here on Zoom for all day. I know that these are necessary and important, but it's I get tired sometimes. So like, I, I, this is a huge, huge room and I just am happy to show up. Um, my name is Sammy Iverson. I use pronouns she, her. Um, I work for Building Changes as a Senior Manager of Education Strategy. Um, we do a variety of work, which my colleague Maret will cover in a little bit for you. But um, just to give you a little bit of information about kind of our roles as um, Senior Managers of Education Strategy, um, my personal work is really connected to the Homeless Student Stability Program that I do see as well happening on the agenda today. Um, my job is really doing the TA and training for the Commerce Grantees, which are nonprofits, all in the tone of um, school housing partnership, getting creative and figuring out kind of how to work together better to best serve students experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, shout out shamelessly to Clark, Whatcom, King, Pearson, Yakima. Um, also, some of y'all might be um, a part of our school housing network, which we'll go into a little bit more later, um, as well as different projects and building changes such as Schoolhouse Washington. Um, I know that I serve with some OSPI partners on the Project Education Impact Work Group, which is doing state level work around um, outcomes for foster care and students experiencing homelessness. Um, and then we're also currently dabbling in the post-secondary space, developing a resource for you all working with youth and young adults transitioning out of high school into whatever it is they feel um, is, a right, is a right and good fit for their next step. Um, so just to give you a sense of the variety of work that we're doing at Building Changes, um, that was just my quick intro. Again, happy to be here. Thank you for having us. And then I'm passing it off to Maret. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you everyone for having us. We appreciate being a part of this space. Um, Sammy and I used to work for school districts, various school districts in um, the state. And so we are getting used to the um, opportunity to join as a vendor partner um, where previously we would participate as staff. So uh, we will try to make it very quick on this Tuesday, liquid sunshine, or I guess for some of us, it's kind of like a Thursday because we have tomorrow off. So um, building changes, building changes pulls together government, philanthropy, and nonprofits in a collective effort to impact homelessness in Washington state. We are not a direct service agency. Um, we act as a driver for innovative strategies that help youth and families emerge out of homelessness and maintain staple housing. 
We advocate for effective practices and fair policies and adequate investments to sustain them. Next slide. Uh, some of you may know us at Schoolhouse Washington. Sammy and I actually manage, um, I am, sorry if I didn't mention this, the second senior manager of education strategy. Uh, my portfolio is scattered around Washington State, but mainly in the uh, South King County community. Um, I, most of my portfolio is philanthropy dollars. So I work on more of the innovation grants. And so um, Schoolhouse Washington is a project of building changes. It's an initiative to improve housing stability and advance education success for more than 40,000 40, students in our state. Um, next slide. Uh, and, excuse me, through Schoolhouse Washington, we're working with students and families, practitioners, policymakers, and funders to develop coordinated action. Um, Sammy mentioned our amazing school housing network, which are made up of superheroes that work in school districts and our community-based organizations. We meet monthly, although um, we adjusted our meeting schedule around the emergence of COVID in March, and we decided to meet um, by bi-weekly to just talk about emergencies and things like that. Um, we have the COVID-19 response and surveys. And so we were able to have those dialogues early in spring. Um, we also have our convening that happens in the fall and in the spring, although we did suspend that due to the COVID-19 um, since we cannot meet in person. But again, we do meet monthly. So if you are interested towards the end of the slide, we are gonna provide our email. Um, but like I said, it's just really made up of amazing superheroes that just meet monthly and just talk about uh, just barriers, successes, strategies, funding needs, resource needs, and things like that. Um, we're also a sounding board that can be used as a risk management if needed, because we are more of a private entity. So, um, you know, we have our research and evaluation team and we have our policy team doing amazing work. Um, we work on strategy development. I heard some folks mention the infographic. I am a true believer of having guidances made for our students here locally, um, coordinated in partnership with our local staff and community-based organization. So if you are interested in participating in coordinated infographics, we do have funding. Um, I can give an example of an infographic that I'm currently working with, um, at, with the amazing staff um, over at Longview Kelso Washington School District. Um, they received our COVID-19 um, emergency fund and um, in doing just like a post interview with them, I asked them what some of the needs were and they just mentioned, uh, communication and engagement with the immigrant communities um, and needing just funding for translation services. Translation services for a school district is pretty expensive and we often have to reach out to outside resources to do the work. Um, for some, they may have ELL um, partners or they may have an in-house translation staff, but not every school district or school buildings have an easy access to them. And so we have funding where we were able to work in partnership with those two school districts, the, Office of the Education Ombudsman, and we're um, developing an infographic that explains McKinney Vento clearly and concisely to families in their community. So it's very unique. Um, and currently we have funding to be used, like we develop, design, publish, and translate it, or will translate materials. Um, we have a focus group coming up next week. We have a stipend for the participants in the focus group. We also pay for the translation material and any other services that are needed. So if you have some amazing ideas and you're like, we just need an innovation dollars or grants, or we wanna see what other districts are doing, you know, reach out to us. Um, we're also hoping that this infographic will be adopted through OSPI and other school districts to use. And you can just change the messaging or the language based off of what your um, language, native language needs are. Um, we provide tailored trainings. Uh, we do race equity. We do, um, we do our convening of resources, cross systems collaboration. We have in the past done McKinney Vento trainings. Um, so if our names look familiar. It's because we co-hosted last year's McKinney Vento training down in Tacoma and Spokane. Um, and so we do tailored options as well as um, early learning post-secondary work. Sammy mentioned our Ascend project that um, she is managing and it's pretty amazing. She'll touch more about that. We increase awareness and funding. Um, like I said, a lot of my funding is philanthropy dollars around community investment and um, community investments. And so that is because of our data research team putting together some amazing dashboards around where the area needs are. Our policy team really going down to Olympia and expanding uh, their legislation work and things like, 
like that. So we have additional funding for staffing, uh, training facilitators at OSPI, and just a bunch of other things. And so next slide. Okay, so there's a lot of there's a lot of text on this slide. Apologies for that, but um, just a few highlights of our Schoolhouse Washington work and our project. Um, I'm just going to really focus on three things um, that I know that many of you are highly familiar with. But um, what we've learned from some of our evaluation and research, and we do have an internal team, which we're very lucky to have. Um, doing that level of work. But um, what we know is that 60% of students experiencing homelessness are students of color. Um, I know that equity and racial equity has been a theme throughout the day, um, but just wanna highlight that. So when we think about how we can best serve students experiencing homelessness, um, it's really, really important to center that around students of color. Um, what we also know is that anywhere from like 75%, three quarters, the majority of our McKinney-Vento population is identifying as doubled up. Um, Building Changes does a lot of cross systems collaboration and partnership work. And what we know is that there aren't as many resources for students in those situations. But for the third point, the very one at the, the one at the very bottom, we also know that students experiencing homelessness, living doubled up, have equally poor academic outcomes as their literally homeless peers. Um, some of us know this to be, you know, a HUD definition versus a Department of Education definition tension. Um, but in our work, specifically at the intersection of education and homelessness, those are really three pieces that we're really trying to drive home and to highlight and to also come up with innovative, interesting ways to figure out how to best serve students experiencing homelessness. Um, which usually looks like coming together with community partners or just being really creative and thinking outside of the box of um, the roles in McKinney Vento liaisons as well as um, other staff. I'm going to go next slide now. Um, and again, some of you may know this well <laughs> or have been a part of it or have been a fund recipient or interacted with our COVID response in some level. Um, I'm gonna ask you to go back in your mind for what feels like a million years, but back in April, um, when the pandemic really started to show up and you know had a variety of impacts, presented a variety of challenges for all of us specifically, um, you all working in the school system um, in serving students experiencing homelessness, Building Changes was really trying to understand kind of what our role was. And we spoke with private philanthropy and they were asking like, what are the needs out there? You know, cause this was obviously a very new time for everyone. Um, so in that effort, we decided that a survey made the most sense. Um, it was across Washington state. Um, we did work together with Schools Connection, Office of Homeless Youth, OSPI. We did talk to all of our system partners about kind of what, what could make sense. Um, a thank you to anyone who participated, but we did hear back from 74 districts including 32 different counties in Washington. At that time, as you remember, the top needs were really food, internet, devices. Um, and what got built from that survey was our COVID-19 response fund. So that's kind of what it looks like when private philanthropy shows up for needs. And our role as Building Changes was to get that money to people that needed it in communities across Washington state with a sense of urgency to help both youth and young adults experiencing homelessness as well as students experiencing homelessness. Um, to date, we've awarded 179 total organizations um, for a total of $2,989,980. Sorry, that's a lot of numbers. Um, but it was, just kind of a reflection again of the work that we do and how you may or may not have been in contact with us at some point. This was a new venture for us in terms of our first time extending funds directly to school districts. Um, so that was something that was both um, exciting and really interesting. Um, and really that whole, the whole point of that fund was to get money as quickly to the work and to meet the needs of students 
as fast as possible. Um, the process was intended to be simplified and quick. Um, on, we are continually accepting applications for that fund. We do have funding left. Um, you'll see in the chat that Marette has sent the link if anyone has not utilized that yet. Um, we have funded, I don't have the exact number of school districts, but I think it was at least half that number. So around, I want to say it's over 80 school districts. But um, Marette and I also, after that first and second round, have started reaching out to fund recipients to get a sense of like, how did it go? And, you know, what were some barriers and just get a feel for how those funds were utilized. And um, as you can imagine, um, it was really, we got some really, really great feedback. There's some really awesome things going on out there. And that um, fund amount was up to 20,000. So some, you know, received five, 10, 20,000 and really just focused in particularly on the needs of students. Um, so that was a really exciting project. Um, I think that it's clear kind of that Marit and I, she mentioned we both have worked in districts prior to this role, but um, yeah, our focus has really been on school housing partnership and just thinking about opportunities. And even though um, the pandemic has really had quite an impact on all of us and continues to do so, um, I will say I I feel like it's also highlighted the strength in our communities and the strength that comes out of cross cross systems collaboration, and um, continue to be inspired constantly by the work that you all are doing. Um, I think our last slide now. So um, this is how you get a hold of either of us. If you have any follow-up questions, if you need help troubleshooting um, the fund application, if you'd like to jump on board to the School Housing Network that's now meeting monthly, um, we are definitely here for you. Uh, and then Marette, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add, but I think that's that's all we have for you today. Yes, thanks for having us. And we, we put our contact information in the chat box. So feel free to connect with us. So grateful to you both for participating and looking forward to fielding any questions and comments from our attendees in the Q&A session coming up in a little bit. And also just want to shout out and say that there was lots of activity in the chat box as you both were sharing uh, of people who have worked with you or are working with you and excited to uh, share with other participants some of the successes and ways that they have accessed uh, some of the resources that you offer. So thank you both again for participating and we're just really excited that you were able to join us today. So next, um, we are joined by Lindsay Green, and she is going to be speaking to coordinated care. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Sharon. Um, really glad to be here with all of you today. My name is Lindsay, and I you see her pronouns, and I'm with Coordinated Care's Apple Health Core Connections program. Um, so Coordinated Care is one of the five uh, Medicaid managed care plans here in Washington State. And we are the Medicaid plan for children and youth who are in foster care, adoption support, alumni of foster care through age 26. So if you're working with any high school youth who are you know, close to turning 18, when they turn 18, um, they remain covered by Medicaid through the month of their 26th birthday. They don't have to take any, um, any steps or actions. Um, and then also families who are uh, reunified are able to stay with coordinated care for one year post reunification. So I wanna spend a little bit of time today talking about access to uh, Medicaid for youth who are in foster care, um, but also a lot of the information in this slide deck is also pertinent to anybody you might be working with who has access to Medicaid. Um, so we will keep going to the next slide. And I have kind of a lot of slides in here today. I'm sorry, I think it's Aubrey who is uh, doing the screen share. So I'm gonna be saying next slide a whole bunch today because I wanted to provide more slides than we're really gonna have time to go over just to, um, to make sure you have some extra resources. Um, so we're gonna talk about how, uh, you know, who served by Apple Health Core Connections, you know, what is covered by Medicaid, um, some of the unique uh, pieces for youth who are in foster care, 
Um, again, what Medicaid services are covered by uh, Provider One, um, talking a little bit about our A to A program for, um, for youth who are in foster care, and then um, some enrollment information for you as well. So next slide, Aubrey. There might be a slight delay here. There we go. So again, um, who's covered, right? Children and youth who are in out of home or in foster care and um, adoption support, uh, youth who are in extended foster care or those who chose not to participate in extended foster care. If they were in care on their 18th birthday, they are covered by Medicaid through the month of their 26th birthday. Um, a couple of exceptions, you probably don't need to know, you know, uh, too many of these. Um, but one of the big ones is if a youth goes into um, a JR facility, they get medical coverage through JRA, but not through Medicaid. And then as soon as they are um, released from detention, they're automatically eligible for Medicaid. Again, there shouldn't be any lapse or gaps in coverage for Medicaid there. So next slide for us. Yeah, and actually, you know what, we're going to um, keep going past this one here, too. Let's keep going. Um, yeah, so first, just a sort of a, a framework, you know, a part of our Apple Health Core Connections program is really making sure that we, um, you know, view our, our youth and our members um, through a recovery-oriented lens. Um, so I just put in a couple of slides here on, you know, some of the language that, um, that our Apple Health Core Connections program is um, really committed to and uh, hoping to see some changes and kind of how documentation looks for youth, especially in the, um, the medical system. So trying really hard to recognize um, uh, recovery oriented language and transition to, you know, a lot of um, words that promote recovery and recognizing that each person um, has the, the capacity to have their best state of, of wellness. So next slide for us, Aubrey. There we go. So just an example, um, you know, uh, words really do matter in sort of how uh, behavior is described, right? So when we're describing behavior uh, from this lens of he stabbed her in, a back, in the back with a pencil, right? The child is oppositional, defiant, severely aggressive, antisocial, um, has anger management issues, right? That kind of language doesn't necessarily promote a whole lot of uh, uh, opportunities for what are the steps that can really be helpful for this child, right? So seeing things like, um, you know, the minor has been severely impacted by trauma, is showing PTSD symptoms, um, such as increased arousal or hyperreactiveness, you know, mistrust. Uh, those kinds of things, you know, it lends itself to um, to this uh, uh, recovery oriented or strength based approach um, that really focuses more on how do we help this child with the symptoms that they're experiencing, as opposed to um, really just kind of describing the, describing that child uh, through the lens of, of negative behavior, right? So that's something that coordinated care is working on and a part of our approach um, in working with whole person healthcare and uh, and really viewing people as, as, a, um, as an individual. So you can see some person-centered language examples on there. And I, I'm sure OSCI is doing lots of this work as well. Um, so I kind of wanted to put it in here to show some of those uh, cross-system collaboration opportunities and where we're all kind of uh, working together to really see better, um, better outcomes for, for the youth that we might have uh, in common that we serve. So you can keep going, Aubrey. Yeah, so our main goal at Apple Health Core Connections is really to make it easier, right? Foster parents, caregivers, relative caregivers have so much going on to really meet the emotional needs of, and physical needs of children and youth that they are caring for. Um, and so our team is really there to assist caseworkers and caregivers in making sure that children and youth have um, access to needed physical and behavioral health services in a timely manner. Um, but we see this resulting in improved health outcomes, hopefully fewer placement and treatment disruptions, um, and just you know a better quality of life across a lot of different domains. Um, so the main takeaway for today is if you are working with a youth who is in foster care and they have coordinated care, 
please refer them to us if they are having any kind of uh, issues or concerns related to accessing physical or behavioral health services. We are here to help them. Um, and this is fairly new, right? Since um, coordinated care has been the Medicaid plan for children and youth in foster care since 2016, April 2016. Um, and prior to that, caregivers didn't really have a whole lot of options for who they could reach out to in you know, navigating the healthcare system. And so there are definitely still families um, and caregivers out there that don't know that they can come to us if they're having a hard time accessing services. So I know it's gonna be kind of a lot of information. So the main takeaway today is refer people to us if they're having a hard time accessing those physical and behavioral health services um, and if they're, they're in foster care. So keep going, Aubrey. Yeah, so this is what our ID card looks like. So if you're ever working with a youth or, or a family and kind of getting a sense like, hey, do you have Medicaid? Um, sometimes people will say, um, you know, I don't know, I have Apple Health or I have coordinated care, right? So here in Washington, um, Apple Health means Medicaid, right? Those two terms are, are interchangeable. If somebody says they have Apple Health, um, that should clue you into Medicaid. Um, and then people on Medicaid here in Washington are, um, in general, assigned to one of the five uh, Medicaid managed care plans. So coordinated care is one of those. Um, and this is just kind of what our ID card looks like that says um, Apple Health Core Connections on it, which clues you in that this is a member who is in foster care. The next slide, please. And on the next slide, I believe you will see um, oh, so uh, some information about how to um, help youth find providers, right? If they are maybe trying to find uh, somebody to be seen for, for a medical issue, right? They can go to the, uh, our main website and click on the find a doctor tool at the top. Um, but the main reason I have this in here is to say, you know, sometimes it can be hard to find a provider that's accepting new Medicaid patients, um, or just in general, finding a provider for maybe dental or something like that. Um, and so if you ever hear of a family saying they're having a difficult time finding a specialist or finding a provider, um, encourage them to call us at that 844-354-9876 number. Um, and our team, uh, our care coordination team uh, can help people. We can call around to provider offices for families, um, get those appointments set up, do a lot of legwork to take that burden off of families. So keep on going, Aubrey. So here are benefits that are covered by Medicaid here in Washington. So if you know that a child is on Medicaid, um, regardless of whether or not they are in foster care, regardless of kind of what managed care plan they have, these are some of the benefits that are covered by Medicaid here in Washington. So, you know, doctor office visits, right, all those well care, preventative care, EPSDT appointments are covered. Um, vision exams are covered. Um, there's prescription benefit coverage through Medicaid. Uh, physical therapy, right, other specialty therapies, um, family planning, which I'll give you a little bit more information on. Um, transgender benefits are also covered by Medicaid here in Washington. And if you need more information on that, um, I am happy to provide it for you. And then also behavioral health, both outpatient and inpatient services are covered by Medicaid. So behavioral health, meaning both um, mental health services as well as substance use disorder services. And next slide for us, Aubrey. Yeah, so um, pharmacy benefits, I left this one in here um, because I wanted you to see that link to the preferred drug list. Um, there are many, many over-the-counter medications that are covered by Medicaid. Um, so again, not just with coordinated care, but um, Medicaid in Washington state covers many over-the-counter medications, things like athlete's foot cream, um, certain lice treatments, other things like that are covered. Um, and so all a family would need to do is get a prescription from their primary care provider in order to, um, to go to the pharmacy and get that covered at no cost to them. Um, so that's a really great benefit that people are not always aware of that they have. Next slide, Aubrey. All right, so vision health is one that comes up a lot too. So vision health here in Washington, Medicaid covers um, an eye exam once per year for people who are 20 and younger. Um, and if they are 20 and younger, then glasses are also covered. 
or if it's deemed medically necessary, then they can also get contact lenses. Um, so that's one of the things that comes up for Medicaid sometimes, you know, people wonder, is orthodontics covered? Can I get contact lenses? Um, it really comes down to medical necessity. If it's deemed medically necessary, then it's something that can be covered. And then for youth, once they turn 21, uh, they, you get one eye exam every two calendar years and no longer uh, are covered for glasses. Um, so there are some resources for getting some discounts on uh, glasses for youth who are 21 and up, um, but it is no longer a covered Medicaid benefit. So if you're working with those youth who are getting close to 21, uh, we're really highly encouraging them to, you know, get another pair of glasses if they're eligible for one and get in for those, um, those annual eye exams before it goes down to every other year. And keep on going for us, Aubrey. Yeah, so I wanted to take just a little bit of time to talk about behavioral health benefits. Um, so why so the wraparound with intensive services is covered um, by the managed care plans now. So that used to go through a different uh, behavioral health system or the, the uh, BHOs, behavioral health organizations. Um, and now WISE is covered through the Medicaid managed care plans, um, as well as PACT for, for older individuals. And substance use treatment um, is also through the managed care plans now. So if you're ever working with a youth that needs WISE, um, you can still refer them to, to coordinated care or whatever their managed care plan is as well. The next slide for us, Aubrey. So what about crisis services? Um, that is still uh, done through the Behavioral Health Administrative Services. Um, so the BHASO, uh, each one, there are nine regions across Washington State, and each one has a crisis line that, uh, that all residents in the service area, regardless of what kind of medical insurance they have, can access. So if you are ever referring um, families to, to call the crisis line for a, either a mental health or a substance use crisis um, that's available across the state um, and you can just go to that link there to figure out kind of what uh, what crisis line is correct for your locality and next slide Aubrey just gonna go really quick here yeah so I'm gonna um, you can just actually click the next slide and I'll talk while it's kind of loading here but Again, for those of you who are in foster care, uh, care management is really at the heart of what we do. Um, we have care coordination teams that can help with finding providers, scheduling appointments, and next slide, um, we'll show some more examples of kind of what they're able to do um, for families. Let's see. Yeah, um, you know, if a, if a youth ever needs surgery, um, if they have a chronic health condition, we can provide them um, some support for, you know, older youth or caregivers for younger children around chronic conditions. Next slide for me, Aubrey. Um, if they need home health, durable medical equipment, medical supplies, all those kinds of things, um, our care coordination teams can help with that. Um, we do some suicide prevention and safety planning. So for any member that ever goes to the ER um, with some uh, for suicidal ideation or a suicide attempt, um, we do outreach to them and make sure they're connected to behavioral health services and that there's a safety plan in place and you know providing some additional support to, to members and to caregivers. Um, and next slide for me, Aubrey. Yeah, and you can just keep on clicking here, click another time, and we'll keep going. Um, but really, it's an ongoing thing. It can be a one-time request. Hey, I have a hard time finding a provider right now. Or, hey, you know, I've got multiple surgery scheduled and need, you know, ongoing support with prior authorizations and all that kind of stuff. So um, families can call us or email us. Um, anybody can send us an email to that HCC team email address. So if you have a family that you know could use some help and they're with coordinated care, you can send us an email um, and just, you know, uh, mark it secure in the subject line. Um, and then that way, you know, we're able to do outreach to that member. We're not going to be able to reach back out to you to say, here's what's going on, right, because of HIPAA and some other um, things like that. But anybody can send us an email and say, you know, hey, I'd like to refer this, um, this member for care coordination. And then we can do outreach. Next slide, Aubrey.
So here's what the Provider One card looks like. Um, so sometimes people, when they say they have Medicaid, they might say, oh, I have Provider One. So it used to be in Washington um, that this was the card that everybody on Medicaid had, and this was the only card that they had, and it was called Fee for Service, right? Um, and then over time, we transitioned to this managed care plan. But there are still some services here in Washington that are, have not been transitioned over to managed care and are still covered by this um, provider one card. So, and some people are still just on this fee for service provider one system. But you can kind of see um, some additional services that are covered specifically through provider one, like dental or for those that need. Um, glasses, you should never ever need to know, you know, what's covered by managed care versus what's still covered by provider one. But I just left it in here just so you can kind of see, you know, some people might be saying the phrase provider one and it's still it's still talking about Medicaid. Yeah. So next slide for us. Um, another really helpful tool that sometimes people are not aware of is Medicaid covers non-emergency medical transportation. So there are regional bro brokers located across the state, and they help with transportation to non-emergency medical appointments. Um, so if you have a family that's on Medicaid, regardless of their managed care plan, um, you can help link them up to the regional broker in your area. Sometimes it's a no-cost ride, sometimes it's gas money, sometimes it's bus tickets. It kind of depends on the locality and what, what's going to be, you know, a cost-effective uh, transportation tool uh, there. Oh, there was a question. What are the five managed care plans? So it's Coordinated Care, Molina, Amera Group, United Healthcare, and CHPW. Um, and not all five are available in each county. And I think we're running really low on time. Um, I just want to say like two more really quick things. So Boys and Girls Club membership, um, our members have access to a no-cost Boys and Girls Club um, across the state, which is really exciting. So if families need, you know, support with after-school programming, that's available. Um, and then if you could just go ahead, like two or three more slides real quick here, Aubrey. I feel like this is taken, I don't, there must just be a delay on my end. Yeah, so some other resources. Yeah, this is what I was going to show you. Um, if you would like flyers like this um, on the inside, it kind of shows all the Medicaid brochures. Just send me an email. I'll put my email address in the chat box. Um, this is really for our, our youth who are in their teenage years. Um, and it just kind of gives them some information about what's covered by Medicaid. Um, and our A to A program, we, um, we reach out to folks before they turn 18 to let them know kind of what, uh, what their rights are, you know, what resources are available to them. Um, all that kind of stuff. So you can see, keep scrolling, Aubrey, and you can just kind of see a little bit of, of what's in there. Oh, I said, said we talked a little more about family planning. So just so you know, right, birth control is covered by Medicaid. Um, a little information in there if you're curious about consent and confidentiality around reproductive um, health care and mental health care services. Um, so yeah, that's a, a pretty whirlwind overview of just a little bit about Medicaid. The key takeaway is please um, feel free to refer families to us um, if they're in foster care and, uh, and with coordinated care, and there's some enrollment information for you too, if a family uh, maybe doesn't have Medicaid currently, um, but could really benefit from them. And I also put some links in there to a training that was done last month at the McKinney Vento and foster care liaison um, meeting and HCA joined that healthcare authority and provided wonderful information about how to um, connect uh, homeless youth with Medicaid as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for um, just an incredible, comprehensive overview of all of uh, all of your services and specific to Medicaid and accessing those resources are really going to be helpful. I know that there are a lot of new liaisons or people new in their roles who are on this call. Uh, in particular, and, and it's just a wonderful collection of resources. And again, for everyone, um, this slide deck, as well as the December slide deck will be made available to you, as well as access to the recorded version of this training. So you will have all of the resources at your fingertips. Um, and, and thank you, Lindsay. So um, at this time, uh, we have we have about two minutes before our scheduled break. Um, we have one more presenter and then we're gonna move into our Q&A after the break. So um, our next presenter is Janet Haikawa from the Arts, from the Learning and Teaching Program. And Janet, I am wondering if your initial activity um, 
maybe why don't we do this? I think Janet has a activity that I will let, you know, uh, make room for her to introduce herself and the activity. We'll do the activity, then we'll move into break. We'll come back and Janet will uh, finish out her presentation before we move into Q&A. So uh, take it away, Janet. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I am at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and I'm the program manager for the arts. And I started about a year ago and two stories that impact me to this day were shared with me within the first month or so when I was working. I had two colleagues unsolicited come up to me and, and say that as a child, the arts saved their lives. And they both went on to talk about their episodes of being homeless and having severe family complications, but they could always turn to the arts as a refuge and it really became a survival tool for them. So my goal today is to present information about the arts and at first we're gonna participate in a little art activity um, to try to convince you if you haven't tried it yet to, to try the arts as a way to support students and families who are experiencing homelessness. So as Sammy had said earlier, um, it's hard to sit for a long time in a conference. So I'm gonna encourage you wherever you are to start moving and get up and stretch a little bit. I know for me, this is my low energy time of day. So if you have a piece of chocolate on the side, you may wanna pop that in, anything to kind of give you a little energy. And while you're doing that, take a look at the prompt that's on the slide there. And it says, how does your heart feel today? I want you to think about that and think about an answer that you can, an that you can express as an object, an animal, or a place. So in other words, what did I write here? My chat box is covering it. A warm breeze, a rocky hill, a fuzzy kitten. Those are just examples. Um, so when you have an idea of how your heart feels today, and expressing it as an object, an animal, or a place, write that down in the chat and let's see what we see. And while you are doing that, I just wanted to give you a little couple of tidbits about the arts. You know, the arts are a part of basic education as stated and stipulated in Washington state law. And the arts are also a requirement for high school graduation. So let's see what people are saying. Oh, a light sweatshirt, Rolly, a squishy sponge, Unquenchable flame, a busy squirrel, awesome, whoa. Lots of very creative ideas here. It makes me want to know more. Now what I'd like you to do is to think about the way you've expressed how your heart feels today. And I want you to translate that into a movement or a pose that you can express through your body. So think about a movement. So something that, you know, are you using your hands? Are you using your face? Are you using your, your upper body? Are you gonna stand up and be full body? So think about either a stance or a movement that you could use to express now that how your heart feels today. And I will say to our presenter crew here who I can see all of your pictures, if you wanna turn off your cameras, and that um, I will ask you to all turn on your cameras at the same time to show your expression. That would be lovely if you're willing to play along. And while you're thinking about what your pose is, I wanna give you a couple more um, tidbits. You know, the, hour, the, the arts have the power to, ex to engage um, and that's half the battle with students, right? So I want, to think, I want you to think about that. What does engagement bring when kids feel engaged with their studies, with school? Um, and also aligns with social emotional learning. Okay, is that enough time? Still, oh, a tired bear. Oh. Um, on the count of three, for those of you who are playing along, want you to turn on your cameras and show your movement or position. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah, look around at what the, all the presenters are doing. Awesome, thank you. All right, that was a very brief arts activity. 
I want you to think about what did you notice about that activity and what did you wonder? And write, write your responses down in the chat. I think you can see that, you know, an activity in and of itself is not arts education, but you can see how a teacher could build on this, right? They could teach academic skills in, in the arts. In other words, what is simile? What is metaphor? What about poetry, creative writing, writing lyrics, um, finding voice in dance and movement skills, using shape or form or space, connecting movements together to create choreography, 21st century skills, communication, critical, creative thinking, social emotional skills, self-expression, building on confidence, and so on. So let's, while you're still responding, I'm going to speak a bit more about um, the arts and the power of the arts to teach. One thing that the arts, another thing that the arts does is it really addresses the whole child. It really does involve the head, the heart and the body. Or as we say in uh, federal government language, the well-rounded education. And at the bottom of the page here, this first slide, there's a link to a study about the transformative power of the arts with people who are exp experiencing homelessness. Um, and as I shared earlier in the story with my colleagues, one of the most impressive things is that many people say how the arts have become a tool to their survival. Um, the city of Manchester in England was experiencing an incredible growth of homelessness in their community. And they turned to the arts as a way to remedy that because they found that even though they were providing homes for people who were homeless, that within six months, they often found people were back out again. And so one, one of the things the arts does is it provides people with a purpose, a way to spend their time. And then it developed many other things um, that we see you list here, reaching out, I want to, having a happy heart, safe risk-taking, allowing you, yourself to be creative. You know, in the thing that we did today, there's no right or wrong answer, right? Personalized with no judgment, using different parts of the brain. So again, with the study that's in the link on the page there, the key benefits that they outlined that were attributed to art making, stress reduction and relaxation, mental health recovery, healing trauma, self-expression and self-discovery, and self-confidence. I will tantalize you later to click on that link once you get the slide deck, because they also list 10 ways that the arts can be used to address the individual, systemic, and structural causes of youth homelessness. So with that, um, let's go to break, Sharon, and then we'll come back and I'll talk about a couple of other studies. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Janet. And there was lots of activity in the chat box. People were really um, engaging in your activity. So we thank you for bringing it to our um, discussion and to our community today. So with that, we are going to break. Uh, it is 15 minutes. So um, doing the math, I think we'll come back at three, a, a little before 320. <laughs> so, um, Nope, that would be a little before 325, give or take a couple minutes. So we will be back here and uh, we'll be here the whole time in the main room. When everybody is pretty much back, uh, no later than 325, we will finish, um, Janet will finish her presentation. We'll move on to our uh, Q&A and then close out. So thank you so much and we'll see you in just a few minutes. <laughs> 